All right, we should be live. Hi, everybody, and welcome. This is the Apostate Prophet. I hope you are having a fantastic day or uh, evening or night or wherever uh, you are, whatever you do over there where you are. Um, I'm here today with a uh, guest that I wanted to talk to for quite a while and who is actually who actually has a lot of nice things to say about the Quran, which is a very holy book. Uh, my guest here is uh, Abdullah Gondal. Is it, that's right, right? Is that how you say it? Uh, yeah, uh, my name is Abdullah Gondal. Thanks for yeah. having me on the show. It's a pleasure. Uh, and likewise, uh, I've been willing to, wanting to talk to you and collaborate with you. And you are, you're bringing an amazing platform and voice to, uh, to these issues as well. Thank you. Thank you. I, I'm, re I'm really glad to have you here. I think I've, I wanted to talk to you for quite a while. We, we never actually came together and communicated. It was all just... Uh, messaging and uh, chatting, texting. I don't know yeah. why we haven't done this before. And I feel like you have a, you, you can bring a very different value to this, which is um, you, st I, I see that you study uh, Islamic scripture a lot and you go a lot into what is wrong with it, what are some interesting things about it, you share those facts with people. Um, and, you, and you can tell us a lot about uh, Islamic scripture and history, so. Uh, that's that's why I invited you here today. I want to talk about uh, the preservation of the Quran, about which you have, uh, I think, made a lot of progress in studying it and, uh, and understanding it and sharing knowledge about it. And especially in the recent days, there's also been a lot of stuff going on in uh, in, in the intellectual Islamic world, which is a, a weird thing to say because I don't believe there's much uh, of intellectual value there, but I'm not, I'm not here for mockery. It's it's anyway. There's been a lot of uh, stuff going around about the preservation of the Quran. Yasser Qadi said uh, said some problematic things that other Muslims have disagreed with. Uh, the whole the whole claim that Islam has always been per perfectly preserved has kind of uh, been a subject of uh, criticism and doubts. Um, <clears throat> And, and that is really a very important aspect in Islam, because in Islam we learn that uh, that the Quran is the only book that has been perfectly preserved, and it comes from Allah directly, and that has never been changed and can never be changed. And um, I don't want to say too much. I don't want to say too many words. I want to rather uh, leave this leave the discourse in that uh, to you, and ask you some questions. So, what is this all about? The, can you tell us more about the preservation of the Quran and the controversies about it? So uh, the issue starts with the uh, Muslims believing that the Quran is the literal verbatim speech of God. That leaves a uh, very little flexibility in how we interpret or uh, internalize the speech. Now the problem happens is Allah being omnipotent and omniscient claims himself in the Quran in Surah 15 verse 9 and he says that I've sent down this reminder and I will guard it. Uh, just a side note is that this God does not have the best track record by his own admission to guard and protect his books from corruption. Like as you can see, Bible, Torah, everything gets corrupted, only Islam is, is uh, the Quran is there. Um, so Muslims generally have claimed, or at least lay Muslim thinks that there's one singular uh, text of the Quran and that the Quran is, uh, is preserved dot to dot, uh, letter by letter, tashkil to tashkil, and some people even say vowel sign to vowel sign. Right? This uh, claim can also be found in uh, Tafim al-Quran, uh, works of Maududi. Uh, and what we will do is we will go take a deep dive into the Quranic preservation claim to completely and categorically show that no, it wasn't perfectly or miraculously preserved. So before we get into it, what I want to put out here is the Quran is well preserved, especially relative uh, to the Bible post Uthmanic canonization. The well preservation still is not miraculous because it does have its flaws. It appears as a human work with uh, its flaws, like as in human memory or the diacritical marks not being there. So you see some variants. So what we will do today, and I'm taking a top down approach is we're going to start with the Qur'ans we see today, the modern Qur'ans, we're going to see some variants in them and how they sometimes might affect the meaning and sometimes they don't. Then we will go to the manuscripts and we will see the Sana Qur'an's lower text as to the extent of variance. And I'm not kidding, you will be shocked. Uh, once we go past the Sana Qur'an, we will talk briefly about the companion codices and then we'll jump into some hadith that 
bring into question even uh, more about the story and the narrative of the Quranic preservation. Um, so to summarize what happened is Yasser Qadi, he's an academic PhD from Yale. Uh, he admitted that the standard narrative of Quranic preservation has holes in it. Uh, and this uh, was, uh, this erupted and became very controversial amongst the Muslims. Because the thing is this, the Quran is the backbone of Islam. If the Quran's preservation and authenticity is called into question, Islam falls apart. And that's the problem here. You can, and as soon as you claim it's the verbatim speech of God, like I said, there's no flexibility. So um, we will, I'll screen share the presentation now. Okay. And we will start. But I believe you've done this before, right? <laughs> yeah, I've done this before a few times. Okay, so can everybody see the uh, the presentation? Is is it clear? Red one. It is. I can see it now. Yes, okay, perfect. So, uh, uh, before we go forward, I want to show you guys a clip of uh, a famous Dawa personality that we all love and cherish, uh, Muhammad Hijab. Uh, he made this video, I believe, in 2015, talking about the preservation of the Quran. And in this video, he claims that the Quran is preserved dot to dot, letter to letter. So let's start by that, so that you know it's not my claim. And then we will get into the variants. I, th I think it's uh, to to point out again. Uh, you kind of you kind of explain it, but I think it's 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 important to point out how how important this claim is. This doctrine is mm -hmm. that the Quran uh, was perfectly preserved. This is the this is really the. The, the the foundation of Islam, the fundamentals of Islam. So uh, for Islam to be true, the Quran must have been perfectly preserved. That that is the core claim that 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 that, that Islam makes. Mm. That this is the only perfect book, the only flawless book that exists, the only message uh, that comes from the Almighty Creator of Allah that exists, and that it can never be changed, uh, which makes Islam miraculous and true for all times. Which means if it is changed, if it turns out that this Quran hasn't been preserved from the, from the beginning and that we can't actually trace it back to some uh, to some legitimate origin, then Islam completely falls apart. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. I had to throw no it problem. So let, let's view this 15 second clip of Muhammad Hijab. Yeah. I think we can't hear the sound. Oh. I think you have to, uh, when you share the screen, you have to do this thing, uh, share with audio or something like that. Okay, well, uh, what we'll do is I'll summarize what he basically says is to, uh, the Quran is a speech of Allah, Allah's promise to preserve it. It's preserved uh, word to word, letter to letter, vowel sign for vowel sign. So he's going by the dot by dot narrative. And then he says, uh, that Allah promised to preserve it, and he then claims that the preservation of the Qur'an is the biggest miracles of the Qur'an. Um, that was his claim. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the way I want to undo this is one of the uh, problems we see is Muslims say that there's one Qur'an, and uh, they'll say that you can pick up any Qur'an in anywhere in the world right now, and it will have the same text, not a dot, not a letter, it will change. This is blatantly false. And the problem is that Muslim scholars have known about all of these issues for thousands of years. And they have documented them too. But the, the issue is the lay Muslim has not been told this. In fact, he's been fed a lie about this miraculous preservation and whatnot. So that's why you keep, you realize why Dr. Yasir Qadi kept saying, don't discuss this in public. Because if you start discussing this in public, the Quran loses its miraculous allure and it becomes just like a historical book, which is well preserved with its flaws. So without further ado, I'll just give you a quick rundown. Um, so these are the rivayat of the Quran. So these are the bunch of different Qur'ans you can find. Um, so on the left, you see the names of the readers, Nafi, Ibn Kathir, Ibn Amir, Hamza, Kisai, and whatnot. And then there are the transmitters. So they had these students who would transmit. Normally, both, most of them had two students. Some of them have three. Uh, what we see is one of the most famous Qur'ans that is being used right now is this version, uh, Hafs uh, bin Asim, okay? And it's not 
uh, actually wasn't the most prominent version throughout uh, Islamic history either. Instead, actually in 1924, it, it was canonized officially uh, by Al-Azhar. Uh, but in essence, the actual Sunni claim is that there are at least seven uh, Sahih readings of the Quran and uh, there's about 10 and then some even push it to 14 and I've heard numbers up to 36. Um, so these, ver uh, these Qur'ans have variants within themselves. Uh, these are all equally authentic. That's what's very important. No Qur'an should take precedence over the other. And just because Hafs is being used predominantly now does not mean it was the, the same case in history. Now that we have this out of the way, um, we will get to our variants. Uh, now what I'm about to show you is actual images from the scripture, and I'll highlight the Arabic text and then the translation as well, where the meanings change, what is being changed. So uh, let's start with our first example. We have from uh, Surah Ghafir, Surah 40, verse 26. So on the left side, you see Hafs text, which is the common text we see. In, in that it says, Oh, fil al fasad. Uh, whereas what says what are you here? So it seems like an extra alif uh, is in the Hafs version, whereas the Wash version is missing one alif. Now, what does it? How does it affect the meaning? It doesn't really affect the meaning uh, in a way, but the problem here is this is a historical claim. Look what's happening. Allah is quoting, it seems, uh, the words of Pharaoh. Now, here's the thing: Pharaoh is a human being. So if Allah is coding him, Pharaoh can only speak in one way. He doesn't speak in variance. So either Pharaoh said he will change your religion or that he will cause corruption, or he said he will change your religion and that he will cause corruption in the land. Mm -hmm. So what we are seeing now is a historical thing is what did Pharaoh actually say? <laughs> like I said, Allah is an omnipotent, omniscient deity. He can absolutely clearly and specifically with precision code people. Uh, at the same time, uh, I would like to add that the Quran doesn't always uh, quote people verbatim. Sometimes it's a summarized form, but uh, you can, by reading the text, decipher if it's being quoted uh, directly or not. Now, yeah, if you have any questions. So just so um, to clarify, uh, what we're seeing here is that the it's not that the verse is completely different, but that um, a letter which uh, ch which slightly changes the meaning in this verse is different. But you know, s some people would say, "So what's the big deal with that?" I mean, it's just a letter. It's not. It, it's not the. It's not the entire sentence. There is no huge difference. But this is actually very important because the Quran is supposed to be directly. It's supposed to have been directly sent, constructed by Allah for uh, for the average person to see so if i'm holding a quran in my hands if i hold this quran in my, in my hand this quran is supposed to have been uh directly planned and uh worded you know um spoken by by allah or have existed with him all the time from mm. from, from from the beginning of time and will always exist until until the end of time but what mm. we're seeing here is that the, is that the text in two different types of the quran is clearly different uh, um Although there is no big difference, the letters are different, which tells us, wait, isn't there a problem here? Doesn't this mean yeah. that there has been something wrong with the preservation of this text? Yeah, so what you see a lot of the times in these variants is these variants are there just not bringing a lot of value or meaning to the worse. And you will see as we progress, we have about 40 some examples from modern Qur'ans. Uh, but they're there for no reason. And if anything, they don't bring value to the worst. They just add more confusion and make it seem more so that, okay, maybe the Aleph, the scribe forgot to add it. And that's what led to this variant reading. But then again, we question, how do we know if that's a mistake or was it the Ahruf reveal, right? We will get to the, that in a later. But the point here to take is if Allah is quoting Pharaoh or uh, Pharaoh saying something, he has to quote it precisely. You can't have two, uh, conflicting statements like that. Anyways, let's go to the next one. So this one is from Surah Hadid, Surah 57, verse 24. In the Hafs text, it reads on the left side, uh, Whereas in the Warsh text, it 
uh, is missing the phrase huwa. It just reads fa inna Allah ghaniul hamid. So it doesn't change the meaning as much, it, but it does show that there's a word omitted in one of the readings. So the translation in the Hafs reads, uh, uh, and whoever turns away, still Allah is the absolute. Uh, who are, who are, whoever turns away, still Allah, the absolute, the owner of praise. So the word huwa is he. So indeed Allah, he who is the absolute, the owner of praise. And that's mm -hmm. what's uh, missing. Now what we can go is we can go to another example. And this is where the this is actual problematic for the meaning. Okay. So in Surah Baqarah, chapter two, verse 184, in the Hafs text, Allah is talking about fasting. And if you can't fast, you have to feed four people. In the Hafs text, Allah says, Ta'amu miskin, which means feeding a poor person, it's one poor person. But in the Warsh text, it's Ta'ami Masakin, it becomes plural. So a singular change to a plural. Now, if I was to read the watch text, I could easily get confused because it's plural, feeding poor people in the plural sense. So wait a second, do we, do, do we feed one person or do we feed two people? And these are the things, like I said, it's just bringing confusion. It's not really adding much. Now, one other thing is, is uh, you will see these kind of variants pop up again and again. And just to give you a, a, a pointer for the moving forward, is keep an eye on the worst numberings as well. Worst numberings rarely ever align between these readings. And why is that important as well? Is because a lot of Islamic Quran miracle claims like the mathematical miracles or the linguistic miracles are incumbent upon the precision of the Quranic language and verse division. But when you actually see that the verse division is off by quite a bit, sometimes you'll see that the verse is the same, but on the right side, it'll be off by three three verses. So it, it doesn't add up for these miracle linguistic claims. So so think about this. Um, you are two two people, two Muslims, and both of them are, are, are always thought that uh, the Quran is this perfect book and that the Quran that you are holding in your hands was uh, directly word for word revealed by Allah to through Gabriel to Muhammad, who then spoke to his to his scribes, who then wrote it down. And the Quran that you are holding in your hands, the biggest miracle of the Quran is that it has been preserved directly from Allah. It comes directly from the source, and word for word is the same. But you are you are two people, two Muslims, who are amazed by this by this fact that the Quran has been perfectly preserved and you are sitting together and you are reading this part and you come across this 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 verse and uh, one of you is reading and saying uh, a ransom of feeding a poor person but then the other person says hey wait it doesn't say poor person it says poor people and then they and, and you and you show each other the Qurans and in both Qurans it says something different and then you look at each other and think wait isn't this Quran supposed to be uh, supposed to have been perfectly preserved, perfectly revealed from Allah directly through Gabriel to Muhammad, to the scribes, to us in our hands. Isn't this Quran supposed to be directly the word that Allah gave to, through, uh, through Gabriel to Muhammad? And you find out, no, there are variations in here. So what are you supposed to think about the rest of the Quran, of the Quran's chain of, of, of revelations uh, up until it lands uh, in your hands? Obviously there is something fishy, something wrong here. Mm -hmm. And as, as we progress, I kid you not, this video will be shocking to a lot of people and the examples will get deeper and deeper. And uh, I won't spoil it, so let's just go to the next example. Uh, here, uh, this one is Surah Kahf, uh, uh, Surah 18, verse 36. So in the Hafs text, it says, uh, Ajidan khayram minha munqalaba. Okay. Whereas in the Warsh text, it says, uh, Also, what I've highlighted is, as I pointed out, the worst numberings are off. As you can see that there is a division of worst ends and starts and huffs, but that doesn't happen that in the Warsh and it just keeps going. Uh, so let's read the translation and how this changes the meaning ever so slightly. So in the Huff's version, we see, and I do not think the hour will occur. And even if I should be brought back to my Lord, I will surely find better than this a return, as in a singular. And 
and the worship seeds surely will find better than these as a return, min huma. Uh, it doesn't affect the meaning per se a lot because he's talking about his gardens in the previous verses, but it's just peculiar that there is a whole uh, letter and phrase added in the verses off, and it doesn't give credence to that it's perfectly preserved and you can also see these things being possible uh lapses in human memory or miss uh, somebody misheard it because they also say that it's very uh, dependent on oral transmission anyways let's go to the next example David, actually... David would say David would just said I'm starting to think that there might be some holds in the narrative <laughs> <laughs> uh no it's actually a funny thing on Twitter some guy said that the uh, the Quran is a Titanic and it has a big hole in it. <laughs> and <laughs> and it's like Muslims keep hoping it stays afloat. That's quite funny. These, these are all little, little um, th poking fun at, at, at what uh, Yasser Qadi said. He said that there is a hole in the, in the, in the narrative, in the standard narrative that the Quran has been perfectly <laughs> preserved, which caused the entire uh, outrage and the absurdity that is currently going on in Muslim debates among each other. So. Uh, it's 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 fine to remind everybody that this was indeed said by a major Muslim apologist and scholar that there might be that there is a hole in the whole narrative and the basic narrative that the Quran has been perfectly preserved in its purest form. Mm -hmm. All right, so this this example is uh, Surah Zukhruf, Surah forty three, verse nineteen. In the half text, now this is quite a significant one, and in a sense that how the diacritical marks uh, can change the meaning of the word or the word completely. And what I need to point out here is the early Quranic manuscripts did not have the diacritical or the vowel markings on them. And if you were to remove <clears throat> the diacritical markings from the highlighted phrase on both sides, the skeleton of both of them is identical. Now here's the problem is the scribe sometimes might, or people who were writing or listening, might have to go by the skeleton, but they had to put the diacritical marks on their own when, so that's why these words might change. Uh, so let's go to the example where it's, it says, It says in Hafs. The watch version reads, وَجَعْلُوا الْمَلَائِكَةَ الَّذِينَ هُمْ عِنْدَ الرَّحْمَانِ So, إِبَادُ الرَّحْمَانِ and عِنْدَ الرَّحْمَانِ the Hafs version reads, and they have made the angels who are slaves of the most merciful, females. The Warsh reads, and they have made the angels who are with the most merciful, females. So one is saying that these angels are abds of Allah, as in the slaves of Allah, and the other is saying that they are with Allah. Uh, that's very peculiar, because like I said, it, it, it doesn't add, the, the existence of this variant doesn't add any benefit. It just uh -huh. makes it seem more that, okay, this is just because the diacritical marks wasn't there and this led to a confusion and it became from Ibad to Inda Rahman. Uh -huh. That's so strange. It's very confusing to that, that this would occur actually. In a now here book. we have uh, Surah Imran. Surah 3, verse 133. This isn't a major variant on its own, but just to show that there's a, an extra uh, letter found in the Hafs version, uh, and it reads, Wasari wala maghfiratim mir rabbikum. Whereas the Wash just reads, Sari wala maghfiratim mir rabbikum. And like I said earlier, what's the point of this variant? What benefit does this addition of this letter bring? And how does it maybe expand on the meaning or give you something so unique, you know? And how could this be evidence of preservation? Uh, the translation is very slightly different. So the letter vowel is used as and here. So it says and hasten to forgiveness. And in watch it says hasten to forgiveness. Uh, the word and is omitted. Now let's go to another example. And uh, this, like I said, when we get to historical accounts is very important because we cannot have any room for contradictions, especially when if Allah is coding people, uh, people don't speak in variants like this you, uh, because Allah can code precisely. Now, here's one example. Surah Qasas, Surah 28, verse 48, and the half side, it talks about the magicians of Moses. So it says, Qalu uh, Sihran uh, Tazahara in Hafs. In Wash, it says Sahiran. 
So again, the problem because of the diacritical marks, weren't the the sahran and sahiran are different. Now, what's the difference in meaning? They are in the Hafs version. It reads, uh, and also remember that Allah seems to be quoting the magicians here. They said two works of magic supporting each other, whereas in the Watch it says they are two magicians supporting each other. So now I ask, were there two magic tricks that were cast by one magician, or were there two magicians who cast two separate tricks, or were there two magicians and one of them only cast the two tricks? <laughs> it, you understand, like with historical things like this, it gets very confusing. This is very strange. There is a, this is a completely different meaning. These are these are two completely different things if you read them in these two different uh, variants. So there really is no point for this uh, change to happen from one Quran version to the other Quran version. Exactly. Well, let's go to another one. Now is where we're getting into even more uh, interesting one about, like I said, historical contradictions. Now, what is happening here in Surah Anbiya, chapter 21, verse 4, is Hafs is quoting Muhammad saying something. Whereas the warsh implies that Allah is commanding Muhammad to say something. You can't have it both ways. What happened first? Did Muhammad say this dua? Or did Allah command Muhammad first to say the dua? <laughs> so I'll read the, the thing. Uh, on Hafsa says, قَالَ رَبِّي يَعْلَمَ الْقَوْلُ فِي السَّمَاءِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَهُوَ السَّمِيُّ الْعَلِيمِ So here the translation is, he, the prophet said, my Lord knows whatever is said through the heavens and the earth, and he is the hearing, the knowing. In the Warsha says, it says, Qul Rabbi ya'lam al -qawl, which means Allah is commanding Muhammad to say. So here it says, say, O Muhammad, my Lord knows whatever is said throughout the heaven and the earth, and he is the hearing and the knowing. You can't square these two together. And I'm, I heard this one bizarre explanation was that the Quran was revealed and because Muhammad was reciting the verse, he was also being quoting himself at the same time. It doesn't make sense it's to me. But no. like, see, what, what happened first? Did Allah talk, command Muhammad, Muhammad said the dua and Allah quoted him. But also, also important is the nature of the content of the dua. My Lord knows whatever is said through the heavens and earth, and he is the hearing and the knowing. It seems more likely that Muhammad would say this statement rather than Allah tell him to say this statement. Because it's coming from a point where Muhammad is saying, my Lord. But that could be a side point. What we will do is we will move to this kala, just to give you an idea, this kala and whole problem is, is not uh, just a single occurrence. It happens a few times. I mean, I, I would say these are fundamentally very different things. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. in, in one instance, uh, the Quran at this point directly uh, orders Muhammad to say these words. I mean, it, if you read this Quran, it says in that one, Allah orders Muhammad to say specific words, like to, to, to praise Allah and to say that he knows whatever is said. And in the other version, it only reports that this is what Muhammad said. In the, so in that version, it is not uh, Allah who commands him to say it. It is just Muhammad saying it and Allah reporting it to us for some strange reason. So there, there really is a major difference here in, in what is being said and what is being transmitted to you, the reader. Exactly. And like I said, one could then say that, okay, are these the words of Muhammad? Or were they actually the words of Allah and Muhammad repeated yeah. Allah's words? So there's That's a, a crucial question. Yeah. And we don't, we never know, right? Yeah. That is so weird. <laughs> Let's go to the next one. So again, in the same surah, uh, Surah Anbiya chapter 21, verse 112, uh, the same thing happens in the Hafs version. It says, Qala, where it's quoting Muhammad. So in and in Warsha says quote. So in the Hafsa says, Qala Rabbi ahkum bil wa Rabbuna Rahman al Mustan wa la matasifun. Which is the Prophet said, My Lord, judge between us in truth. And our Lord is the most merciful, the one whose help is sought against that which you describe. But in the Warsh it says, Allah said to Muhammad, Say, O Muhammad. Oh, my Lord, judge thou in truth. Uh, so what we have now is another instance. Again, it, did Muhammad say that first or did Allah command him? And again, it makes more sense looking at the nature of the dua that 
my Lord judge between us and truth would be coming from Muhammad first. It sounds more of a, a human praying to God rather than the other way around. But then again, we have instances where Allah tells him to say specific du'as. Again, a, a, con a historical contradiction of what happened first. Honestly, uh, with, with my experience of the Quran, I would, I would totally think that, um, that, that Allah is ordering Muhammad or anybody to say something and, he, and he's simply here, uh, you know, addressing the prophet and making mm -hmm. him say something. I mean, th that, that, is, that would be from um, when I think about other verses that contain similar things where it says say, you know, where we have several, several Quran chapters that start with say and several Quran mm -hmm. verses, uh, prominent ones that start with say and then uh, order Muhammad and others uh, to say specific words. So in, in this case, I would also um, simply for that familiarity think that uh, Allah wants us, Muhammad first, but all of us to say a specific thing. But that is the problem. That This is what you would think if you read the one version, yet if you read the other version, it is something, something completely different and it is just a report about Muhammad. So dear Muslims who think um, the Quran has been perfectly preserved and this is directly Allah's word, what do you exactly think about this? What are we supposed to think about this? This is quite confusing. Exactly. Now let's go to another example. Mm -hmm. And this one is interesting. Surah Baqarah, the chapter 2, verse 119. So the Hafs version uh, says, The uh, Warsh version says, Tas'al, whereas Hafs said Tas'al. So literally, like I said, the vowel markings, the vowel sounds can change the meaning. So in Hafs, it says, indeed, we have sent you, O Muhammad, with the truth as a bringer of good tidings and a warner. And this is where the variant is. And you will not be asked about the companions of hellfire. Whereas in the Warsh version, it becomes, and do not ask about the companions of hellfire. This is quite important. In one place, Allah is saying, I will not question you about them and what they do. But then in the other one, it says, Allah is saying, telling him, do not ask me about them. This is a completely different thing. Exactly. It's a, it, it's very important and uh, it, says, it means completely different. So for the, for the context, um, Abdullah, uh, for clarification, obviously people would think, people would wonder about what, what Muslim apologists who are familiar with these, uh, with these issues uh, say in response to these things. So how exactly do Muslim apologists, for example, explain this discrepancy of these two uh, variants which completely conflict in their meaning with each other? Yeah, so uh, normally they will say that the readings, all of them, all the variants are all revealed by Allah and they recite this hadith about ahruf, uh, I have the hadith in the last part. Uh, we will get to a detailed discussion about the ahruf, but the, to give give you a gist of it, ahruf is the save it all, uh, get out of jail free card for Muslims. Mm -hmm. uh, it's vague and they'll, they'll say that every one of them is, uh, is complementing each other. They're all revealed and they can't be viewed in isolation. That's what they'll say. They'll say they have to be read together and all the verses need to be viewed with their content joined. So you can't view them in isolation in the sense that you can't say, oh, what says, and do not ask, and then Huff says, and you will not. It's actually Allah saying, you will not be asked, and you shouldn't also ask. That's what they come up with, is their reason. They combine all the verses and all the variants and come up with a compound explanation for it. And the one of the problems, they will keep saying that there is no contradiction. But like I said, there are just straight up contradictions that cannot be squared unless you start arguing about the Schrodinger's Quran or a quantum mechanic version of Ahruf where superposition words are coming out in different variants. It's, it gets bizarre. It, it doesn't really answer the question, right? I mean, why do we have these different, uh, these different versions to begin with? I mean, what, what, exactly, right? Why would that happen in a in, in with a book that explicitly and very specifically, very prominently claims to be the one book that is one and that is unchangeable, that to, to which no human can make any addition or any change, mm -hmm. which uh, exists directly as it existed before creation and will always exist in the same way. Why would there be uh, multiple different uh, versions of this and, and, and the versions clearly have discrepancies with each other? Why would this possibly exist? Exactly. So one of the reasons they give is that Gabriel revealed it in different ways.
to help people recite whatever is easy for them. <laughs> but like I said, like I said, a lot of these variants, they don't bring any ease or any value to the work. They're just there. And they, if anything, lead you to believe, okay, this probably the scribal error and it got incorporated into the manuscript and then it became part of the recital and Muslims have been reciting a scribal error, who knows? One of the problems that is also important is this, uh, I was gonna discuss in later, but I'll sh share it now, is the Quran does not claim it has any variants. Mm -hmm. You can only source external hadith that probably were written a hundred years after Muhammad mm -hmm to say that the Quran has variants, which were most probably back projections and post hoc rationalization yeah. to explain this mess. And we will get to, when we get to the manuscript, we'll briefly talk about the companion codices and how much conflict they had and the discrepancies. And then you'll understand why Osman had to take a huge step and why it made sense that he had to burn the Quran. Mm -hmm. Because the discrepancy mm -hmm. between the Sahaba was just too much. Yeah. Yeah. So what we'll see is every layer from the modern Quran, the manuscript, the Sahaba, the Hadith to Muhammad, you'll see every step of the way, it is anything but perfect, miraculous preservation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. All right, yeah, let's go to the next example. Uh, so this is Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 140. In the Hafs version, it says, Am taquluna inna Ibrahim wa Ismail wa Ishaq. Whereas Warsh says, Am yaqulun. So... The translation is, or do you say that Abraham and Ishmael and Isaac and Jacob and the descendants were Jews or Christians? Versus the Wash version, which says, or do they say that Abraham and Ishmael and Isaac and Jacob were the descendants? So it's, do you say that or do they say that? Now, it doesn't make sense for Allah to say, do you say that? Because if you read the previous verses, there's a conversation. And if you look at the flow of the conversation, uh, the it, it should be the the non-Muslims saying they they saying that Abraham and Ismail and Jacob were descendants of Jews and Christians because Muslims and then Muhammad replies actually what's also interesting is after this Allah then says to reply are you more knowing or is Allah again it could also be used and explained in a way where you can say or do you say was also this you was a, a plural and was referring mm -hmm. to the Muslims, or also plural referring to the, the Kufar as well. So like I said, there is a lot of like a lot of apologetics, but the central point that we need to take from here is, again, you can see it's the diacritical marks that were changing. Mm -hmm. Other than that, it was fine. But like I said, what's the point of adding this confusion? I mean, I would kind of understand that um, that even if we uh, just take this verse in isolation, do you say or do they say it could basically mean the same thing, uh, you know, just referring to those people. It could be speaking directly to them or it could be speaking about them. Mm -hmm. But 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 what exactly is the point in this variation? There is simply no point to, to making this variation. That's exactly strange. I, I feel like the do some sometimes you will feel and uh, a lot of times if you read these academic articles on these issues they point out that certain readings flow better than others and certain readings are actually grammatically sometimes more uh more palatable than the other ones too so then you're almost wondering why would god do this to make one reading incorrect or let's say less eloquent than the other one mm -hmm. anyway let's go on to the next example here we have another example of an omission. So in the Hafs version, uh, Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 132, it says, biha Ibrahim. And in the Warsh version, it says, Wa -awsa. So in the Warsh version, we have an extra alif uh, between the two vowels. Uh, the meaning does not change at all, honestly. It becomes from, and Abraham enjoined his sons to Abraham instructed his sons. Uh, it's not a big difference in meaning, but again, pointing out that this addition and discrepancy is there. Uh, here we have Surah Al-Anam, Surah 6, verse 63. And uh, the Warsh is on the left in this case, and Hafs is on the right. Uh, so the discrepancy here is, La in anjaytana min hazi, is what it says in the Warsh, anjaytana. In Hafs, it says anjana. So there, is the ta and the ya that's missing from the Hafs version. Now, how does it read? And this is interesting. So Allah is telling 
say, who rescues you from the darkness of the land and sea when you call upon him imploring al aloud and privately? And then he quotes the disbeliever saying, if you should save us from this crisis, we will surely be amongst the thankful. Whereas in the other, in the Hafs, it says, if he should save us from this crisis, we surely be among the thankful. Again, this, this doesn't specify if Allah is quoting a specific group of people, but it, it's a general uh, flow of conversation that seems to be uh, taking place here. So I wouldn't say that this is a conflict in, in meaning per se, but again, it, it seems that Anjana and Anjaitana, this discrepancy could have uh, come from the manuscripts and again, the diacritical markings. Mm -hmm. And again, like it doesn't really add anything. Yeah. yeah. Again, this is a Nothing simple of significance. Uh, Surah 9, Surah Tawbah, verse 107. And the Hafs version has uh, got an extra vowel in the beginning, which says, well, Whereas the Wash version says, Al So the word and is omitted from the Warsh and it's present in the Hafs. So it reads, and there are those who put up a mosque by way of mischief versus there are those who put up a mosque by way of mischief. It's the, it means the same. Again, like, what's the point of this? There, there's literally nothing here that this, that this uh, serves, that this variation serves. There's, there is no use of it at all. Like, exactly. no, 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 one will, no one can really come here with a straight face, say, well, there's obviously a reason this is here because uh, it, in this way, it is, it is much easier to read and, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so here we have uh, uh, Surah Shu'ara, Surah 26, verse 217. In the Hafs version, it reads, which means, and rely upon the exalted and might the merciful. But the Warsh, instead of the Wow, it has the letter Fa. So it reads, which means, so rely upon or therefore rely upon. Again, mm -hmm. it's not a big change in meaning, but what's also interesting is the wow and the fa thing uh, happens a few times, I believe, and it's because the vow, when written in the skeletal form, can be very close in how it's written and can be confused to be joined with the mm -hmm. ta, and then it can be mistaken for a fa. So that is one possible explanation for this. Like I said, I'm not going deep dive and looking at where this word is found in the manuscript and seeing this skeletal structure i'm not doing that right now mm -hmm. in detail it's not the the point of this uh, presentation mm -hmm. uh here again we have surah shura uh, surah 42 verse 30 in the hafs version it reads whereas in the watch version it reads so the letter fa is again additional in hafs and it's non existent in the wash. Does it change the meaning at all? No, not really, but I'll read it out for you. And whatever strikes you of disaster, then it is what your hands have earned, versus whatever strikes you of the disaster, it is of your hands what it's earned. So it's not uh, really, again, like it doesn't really change the meaning much. Uh, here, uh, the meaning isn't changed, but there are a couple of uh, letters additions. So in the Hafs, it says, uh, hil. So I'll read it. Hil anfus. But in the Shuba, uh, this is not the watch version, by the way, just to get give you an idea, there's about uh, five, six, I might, there'll be different versions that might pop up. Uh, but this one is found in Shuba where it says ma tashtahil anfus so what you see is in hafs you have he hill at the end where it's tashtahil so there's a few letters missing although uh the meaning doesn't change now again like why would you do that i'm not going to get into linguistics and some people can uh, go into details we, there are arguments uh, i did mention this earlier that certain versions will be grammatically better than other ones and we will come in one example about that too uh again we see another instance of uh, surah shams uh, surah 91 verse 15 where the va and the fa is uh, is mixed up so in the hafs it reads Wala and warsh it reads Fala so one is and he does not fear the consequence thereof and the other one is therefore he does not fear the consequence thereof all right, 
Next one, again, we have an instance of another problem with the Qul and Qala. So this time is uh, it's in Surah Jinn, Surah 72. Huff says, Qul innama ad'u rabbi wa la ushrik bihi ahada. Whereas Wash says, Qala innama ad'u rabbi wa la ushriku bihi ahada. So what's going on here is Hafs is commanding Muhammad to say the following words. I only invoke my Lord and do not associate with him anyone. Whereas the Wash again is quoting Muhammad saying, I only invoke my Lord and do not associate with him anyone. Mm -hmm. Again, what happened first, the sequence and chronology of historical events. Okay. Uh, so again, the same concept. One is from the perspective of Allah, one is from the perspective of, of Muhammad, which mm -hmm. again makes no sense. Yeah. And now we have Surah Mu'minun, it's Surah 23, verse 89. Uh, this is a very slight, it does not change the meaning, it's just a slight omission. And like, again, you'll see what's the point. Uh, Huff says, Sayakuluna lillah, which means they say it belongs to Allah. Whereas the Duri, so this is another Quran. Uh, this is not Shuba, this is not Wash, this is the Duri Revaya. Uh, this one does not say lillah, it has an extra Aleph between Sayakulun and the Allah, and it says Sayakulun Allah instead of lillah. So here it says, they will say Allah. So one is it saying lilla meaning be this belongs to Allah or it's a possessive, whereas the other one is uh, they will say Allah. I assume that the previous verse talks about something that belongs to yeah. Allah and then in this, uh, yeah, okay. So it doesn't really affect the meaning in any mm -hmm. crucial way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, this one is a like very simple example. I mean, uh, here, because the Aleph is missing, that's why it was written differently in the Warsh. So it's Surah Ahqaf. Uh, Surah 46, verse 15. In the Hafs, it says, And it's talking about being nice to your parents. So it translates in the Hafs version as, and we have enjoined on man to his parents' kindness. Whereas the word Ihsana is changed to Husna in Wash, and it translates almost the same. It's like, we have, pre we have enjoined on man to treat his parents in a beautiful manner. So kind manner, beautiful manner, uh, but the point is that there's just one Aleph missing. Now let's go to Surah Yasin, Surah 36, verse 35. <clears throat> How many more of, of these examples do we have? Like, uh, so we're almost at the, if we have uh, 40 examples from the modern Qur'ans, and then we have a bunch of extreme uh, big variants uh, uh -huh. from uh, the Sana Qur'an, then we have a couple of hadith, and then we end it up. Okay. But we're halfway through, probably past yeah. that. Yeah, okay. So in the Hafs version, it says, Vama Amilat Hu, whereas Shoba says, Vama uh, Amilat. So, Hu is an extra addition in the Hafs version, whereas Shoba doesn't uh, exist. The translation isn't affected uh, as bad at all, in fact. It says that they may eat of its fruit and not made it their hands, whereas Shoba says, and not made their hands. So it's it's a very small difference, but just pointing out that again the text of the Qurans is not identical. Now we're going into some. So this is interesting. Now you'll see uh, plural and singular pages. So this is Surah Rad, Surah 13, verse 42, and in the Hafs version it says, "Wasaya uh, alamul kuffar." So. Uh, and in the Warsh it says, وَسَيَعْلَمُوا kafir." So kuffar is plural and kafir is singular. How does this translate? <clears throat> he knows what every soul earns and the disbelievers will know for him for whom is the final home. And in the Warsh it translates, he who knows what every soul earns and the disbeliever will know for whom is the final home. So it's a singular plural thing. <clears throat> and you will see this happen quite a few times actually. Again, it happens in Surah 66, verse 12. Uh, in Hafs, uh, it says, وَصَدَقَتْ بِكَلِمَاتِ رَبِّهَا وَكُتُبِهِ وَكَانَتْ مِنَ الْقَانِتِينَ And it says, and she believed in the words of her Lord and his books, and she was of the devoutly obedient. Whereas in the Warsh, it says, كِتَابِهِ, which is one book. So it says, and she believed in the word of her Lord and his book. So we have again um, 
we have the same letters in both versions, but we have the but we have different different symbols, vowel different right. signs, different vowel, and uh, which 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 slightly changes the meaning. So what 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 we see here is that um, is that the Quran was in the same way preserved until uh, a certain point, where then. Uh, Different diacritical uh, symbols were added to it, which caused the Quran to be slightly corrupted from one Quran to the other, which is yeah, not supposed to happen. There's a whole history of this uh, caliph and his appointee uh, Hajjaj mm -hmm. bin Yusuf mm -hmm. adding and uh, adding these marks and then changing some words around. I made a video about that long ago. I can, like, oh, okay, perfect. Or so. Mm -hmm. so if you want to look at that, you can uh, refer to that video for details. Oh, we can definitely talk about it. In the... <laughs> <laughs> now we get to another one. Uh, here, this is uh, quite interesting. In Surah Ahraf, uh, Surah 7, verse 141, uh, the Hafs version says, Su ul azab yuqatilun, yuqatilun abna'akum wa yastahyuna nisa'akum. Whereas the worst version says, Su ul azab yuqatilun and yuqatilun. So their tenses are being changed. So what happens in the meaning is, and <clears throat> when we saved you from the people of the Pharaoh who were afflicting you with the worst of torment, they were killing your sons. Uh, so that's like a, 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 a continuous uh, tense, whereas uh, in present, and then this one is they killed your sons. Mm -hmm. So it just changes the tense. Okay. The meaning isn't affected as bad. Mm -hmm. But again, uh, so we'll go to, to one more example of... Uh, I think people get the point, so I'll just speed through these last yeah. examples. Yeah, there, there are just a lot of variations that happen because of the because of the signs used. So yeah, these so are, are a lot uh, of examples. Yeah, twenty-one, one of four, and the half size that says "Kitay uh, Sajil Lil Kutub," whereas Warsh says "Kitab," and Allah's talking about rolling up the heavens at the day of judgment. And one place he says, uh, "The day we roll up the heavens like a scroll rolled up for books in plural sense." And the other verse says, scroll rolled up for a book. Uh, so like a singular plural. Mm -hmm. Let's go to the next one. And this one was weird where I, I did read that one of the versions is grammatically correct and the other one isn't. Uh, like I said, uh, I'm not going to comment too much on that, but I did leave on the side the, from Corpus Quran, the word by word, which shows if anybody's interested what's happening here. His salawatak. It, it says is a second person masculine singular possessive pronoun and it gets changed to salawatik. So why everything else seems to be identical in the verses. It's just that this thing changes. And like I said earlier, uh, people will point out and scholars will point out that some uh, versions of, uh, of the verses flow better in a grammatical sense. Now, this one's interesting too. In Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 165, uh, Haf says, uh, whereas Wash says, and uh, it does change the meaning slightly. So here it is. And if only they who have wronged would consider that when they see the punishment, okay? Versus, uh, it says, and if only they who have wronged would consider that when you see the punishment. Mm -hmm. So, it, Verse, it doesn't, it's again, the, the tara and the yara are exactly identical. It said the dot put on top versus the dot put on bottom. Completely change the perspective who's being addressed here. So yara is like they, but then y, tara is like you. Now, okay. here, uh, this one is from Surah can, can, we, can we proceed to, um, I, the, the thing is, I, th I think, uh, and we, we see that there is obviously a lot of discrepancy in, uh, in, certain, in certain verses with certain letters and certain symbols. Um, we'll can, the can, can, then, we, yeah. can we proceed to uh, major ones? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, then go ahead to, to yeah, I'll just quickly show these message. slides uh -huh. and then move on. Yarona Hom, Tarona Hom, 313, Warsh uh, Yudhilhu, Nudhilhu, Surah 48, 17. Ahzab, this is interesting. Haf says Kabira, Warsh says Kathira. One means great, one means uh, multitude or abundant. Mm -hmm. In Surah Hijr, one says Nunazil, and uh, verse 8, and Warsh says Tanazil. So we do not send down angels, you do not send down the angels. Uh, Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 85, it says, Ta'malun, you do, Ya'malun, they do. Nun shizuha, Surah Baqarah 2, 259, uh, we raise them, or it says, Nun shiruha, we revive them. 
Nakhfil Lakum, Yakhfil Lakum, 2258 is Surah Baqarah. We will forgive, and versus He will forgive. Uh, this one, uh, Surah Maida, chapter 5, verse 54, again, one of the grammatical numbers. One says, Yartadda, and one is Yartadid Minkum, means the same. Surah Imran, chapter 3, verse 81, Haf says, Ataytukum, and Wash says, Ataynakum. Didn't change the meaning here as much. Uh, Surah Nasa, chapter 4, verse 152, uh, it says, uh, Yuti him, in Hafs and Wash says, Nuti him, we give, a verse as he is going to give. This one is important, I'll just spend two seconds here, is uh, meaning changes here. Uh, Surah 3, verse 146, the Haf says, versus Wash says, uh, So one says, how many a prophet fought with him, versus the other one says, how many a prophet were killed? Uh, so this is a problem as well. Did they fight and then they died, or you can also say the fighting entailed the killing. Uh, here we have another interesting one where Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 9, is uh, starts with Yukhadi'un Allah, but then switches to Yukhda'un Allah. The same phrase occurs in this verse twice. Because the worst version sticks with the same word, both occurrences, Yukhadi'un Allah, Yukhadi'un illa anfusihim. Now the translation does change. It says, they seek to deceive Allah and those who believe, but they deceive not except themselves. Or it says, they seek to deceive Allah and those who believe, but they seek to deceive not except themselves. Uh, this is a, sm a small variant and meaning change here. Now we are uh, at the juicy part. And what I want you to know that if you thought that those discrepancies and variants were of any value, uh, we're going to go from, let's say, from a zero to a hundred now. <clears throat> You're about to see whole phrases versus omitted words being moved around, sequences change and whatnot. So without further ado, I'm going to start. Okay. This is the Sana Quran, just to briefly describe it's a palimpsest. What happened was it had a lower text, which is erased in an upper text written, which is what some people said the Osmani Quran. Over time, the ink uh, popped up and you can extract the lower text using UV lights and we can read what was uh, in the lower text. Now, the lower text has variants that confirm to a lot of reported uh, companion codices, and these are ex uh, uh, major variants. So without further ado, we'll uh, analyze these two papers. Uh, one is the Codex of a Companion of Prophet, and the other one, Sana one, and the Origin of the Quran, is written by uh, professors and uh, academics uh, from Stanford and Harvard University. I have uh, personally talked with them once or twice, uh, but let's get into it. So. Uh, on the left side, this is where it gets crazy. So on the left side, you will see the description of the variant. And from now on, we will refer to the lower text of Sana as C1. So the standard text of the tradition in Quran chapter 2, verse 196 reads, Do not shave your heads until the offering reaches its destination. The lower text says, Do not shave until the offering reaches its destination. So the whole word Ra'usakum is missing. In the same verse, the standard text says, if any of you be sick, but the lower text reads, should any of you be sick? Uh, meaning that the lower text has, fa in kana ahadun, instead of the standard, fa man kana ah. Uh, this is the same verse again. It says, uh, the standard text, fasting or arms or an offering, whereas the lower text only says fasting or an offering. It doesn't mention the word al uh, sadaqatin. So there is that omission. Now, and we see the similar omission where a word well, uh, C1, the lower text, has wal akhirati instead of the standard hasanatan wa fil akhirati hasanatan. In chapter 63, verse 7, we see in the standard text of the Quran, <clears throat> it's uh, <clears throat> that they may disperse. Yan faddu. But in the lower text, there's additional phrase, yan faddu min hawlihi. Okay, now on the right side, if you go to table four, you can see where uh, the C1 lower text will actually agree with uh, uh, narrations recounting companion codices and their variants. They're recorded in books like Kitab al Masahif, Suyuti Zit Khan, and, and uh, Al Fahrist. Uh, just to give you one additional point that Kitab al Masahif is the book that Yasir Qadi did mention in his email by name that were leaked in 2016 saying that. Just a cursory reading of the book 
leads one to question the standard narrative of the Quran. So we'll keep going. What we see is that in the Usmani Quran, in verse uh, chapter 2, verse 217, it says, Qital says, An qital fihi. But what's the next one is very important. This is where the whole verse's structure is being changed around, and we can see that. And what we see is in uh, Surah 2, verse 222, it says, nisa fil wala Whereas in C1, it, it says, فَلَا تَقْرَبُوا نِسَا فِي الْمَحِيدِهِنْ حَتَّى يَتَحْرْنَ There's a huge omission here, and the verses are not the same. The phrases are moving around. And you can see that on the right side, it's telling that it actually matches <clears throat> with a companion reported codex. Now we'll go more again, and we see that in Surah 5, uh, verse 45 in the Osmanic text, we read, وَكَتَبْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ Whereas in C1, the lower text read, بَكَتَبْنَا ala bani Israel, so which means we uh, enjoin upon them versus we enjoin upon the people of Israel, right? Uh, again, we talked about the Yanfadu example, so we're going to go to table number six, and now we're getting into uh, major elements. And, uh, so uh, here we see type of difference and uh, word order. So the word is changed where it occurs in the verse completely. In chapter 5, verse 41, Walahum fil akhirati is the Osmanic reading. The C1 reads, Wa fil akhirati lahum. Okay. Then uh, in 2196, it says in the Osmanic text, is taysara, but in C1, it says tayasara. Then ta'muruna, uh, ya'muruna in 1565. And this one's interesting as well. In Surah 5, verse 43, it says in the Osmanic text, al nabiyuna whereas the C1 has a different plural, which sounds better, an ambiya. Then in Surah 2, verse 29, al-ayati, and singular al-ayat and al-ayati. So it's a singular plural change, then there's a verb tense or mood change in 5.552, fayusbihu is in Osmanic text, fayusbihuna is in the C1. And again, we see an active to passive change in Surah 5, verse 47, Osman says, Anzalallahu fihi. C1 reads, Unzila alayhim fihi. It's very different sounding. It's, again, now one starts to question okay, so we can see there's a lot of interpolation going on. So let's keep going. And the, the, what I'm trying to show right now, we're in the minor major. Let's say they're limited to a few phrases. Uh, in a few slides, we will go to the huge omissions and additions where chunks are added in verses. Okay? The, the, the thing, the, the, I think the problem here is, Abdullah, the Quran alone is, is, a, is a book that is very hard to listen to. And oh, very, yeah. And very, <laughs> it is very hard to listen to, very hard to sit there and just and, and take that in. You know, it's, it's like I remember people in mosques listening to the Quran, just falling asleep and getting so oh, bored. Yeah. I, it's, I it's, up, yeah. <laughs> it's, it is it is horrible. I mean, I remember myself completely to getting into this uh, sweet sleep mode. Even when I was in my most religious moment, when I was so passionate about the Quran, I was just I was just getting into this sweet sleep mode that I was trying to resist because it's inappropriate to sleep while the Quran is being yeah. uh, <laughs> recited and you have to stay awake. So I don't know. Um, we we have we have a lot of a lot of issues here. We see that uh, not only the Quran itself is is, very, is a very hard to read book that is uh, that is definitely not appealing to a to an average person. We also see that uh, in the revelation of the Quran, there is a lot of stuff that has been really going going wrong. There is obviously a lot of uh, a lot of proof to that, a lot of examples to that here. Um, I'm going to quickly speed through because, uh, well, yeah. like you said, like the, nobody wants to hear me recite the Arabic over and over. So I'll pick up a few examples. I, I think I think everybody wants to hear you, and I, I think people are also here for your mustache, oh, okay. especially. But, <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, so I, think, I think I think people would be a little bit bored from listening to the whole uh, Quran variants, to be very honest. Okay. Okay. So what we'll do is all this pick out. We've talked about these verses before, but what I'm showing now is when the Arabic is written next to each other the impact and then you see how much of an interpolation and worse changing is happening so if you can see on the left side in the top left corner here we're talking about the osmanics min siyamin aw sudqatin aw nusuk and this is what's in the manuscript min siyamin aw nusuk so you can see similar case a lot of interpolation here baghiyam uh, baynahum is uh, omitted it's not existent in the manuscript 
Allazina khalaw min qablikum. So the word khalaw is not existent in the in the manuscript and lower text as well. Uh, in two two seventeen kufr bihi wa kufrun bihi the the whole phrase wa kufrun bihi does not exist in the lower text. In surah two verse two seventeen yuruddu kum an dinukum yuruddu kum is omitted again in the lower text. Uh, in Surah 2, 218, in Osman it says, Inna lazina amanu wa lazina hajaru wa jahadu. Whereas in uh, C1 it says, Inna lazina amanu wa hajaru. The jahadu uh, is omitted. Now what we're going to get to uh, in a little bit after the omissions is uh, the insertions. So we have an, a few more here. Uh, so the word uh, bi'izni is not found in the manuscripts uh, in the Sana Quran, lower text in verse 2 to 1. Uh, then we just talked about the sentence structure completely being flipped around in uh, this verse in uh, Surah Baqarah chapter 2, verse 222 about menstruation. And this is very interesting. So I'll read the actual version. Whereas the omission is uh, and the sentence structure changes. So it's a completely different sentence structure. Uh, we already saw that the is completely omitted in 552 and 554. Uh, the Nas is omitted. Uh, what we will go to is now the next one. Actually, uh, in 63.1, the word Alu is actually not found in the manuscript as well in the Lord text. Uh, now we're going to the additions. So this is where they're adding. We find additional parts uh, of phrases in the lower text that are not found in the Osmanic Quran. Uh, and there are certain, the, if you want, I'm going to go through this fast, but there, stop and read the comments of the scholar here because they will point out some very peculiar uh, instances where uh, the occurrence of the phrase would be expected in a certain way, but will occur differently because a different scribe was writing it. And if a different scribe is writing it, he's not familiar with a certain reading and whatnot. There's, a, it's a very interesting. If you want to read it, it's amazing. So, anyways, in uh, Surah Two, verse one ninety three, the Osmanic Quran is Waykuna Dina Lilla that all religions for Allah. But there's the addition of the word Kulluhu Waykuna Dina Kulluhu Lilla in lower text. Uh, and then we already talked about those verses. Uh, so in 544, this one is actually quite interesting. This is actually quite significant, the addition here. The normal text read, uh, And additional phrases here are, this is a huge chunk added into it in the in the lower text. I can't read it because there's a lot of appearances and stuff. Uh, we already talked about وَكَتَبْنَا عَلَى بَنِي Israel. The phrase Bani Israel is additional in the lower text. Uh, now here we see in... So uh, there's actually a good amount of words added oh, it's, it's into, a lot into of the text. That's, that's, it's that's a lot very... Of so this is this is beyond just little uh, little changes, little variations in letters and, and symbols. You see that there is a... That there are that there is a lot of text actually added here to the, to yeah. the, to the original text of the Quran. So. And what's also fascinating is you see the evolution of the canonization process with this, because you can see how these, uh, the Quran was and how it evolved and how it came to its final form. Uh, so one on this side here, it says in the Osmanic Quran in Surah 63, verse three, kafaru. whereas in the lower text, there's an additional uh, and then in the same verse, uh, it says that uh, in the Osmanic Quran, it says, Zalika Benam and dot dot dot, Kataba ala Kulu, pardon me, Kataba ala Kulu Bihim, Sorry if I can't, it's very tiny. Uh, and in the lower text, Zalika Benahum Kaumun is additional, it's completely added. It's not just one word, it's like a good four. Four word phrase. Uh, we talked about min uh, There's an additional word in the uh, in the lower text. Well, is that to Jamia in sixty three eight? 
again, uh, more additions on the left side. Uh, mm -hmm. We talked about 2196 before, about what they're going to talk about here, substitution. And this is very important because many scholars have in the past written books and books saying that uh, you cannot even imagine to change a word or substitute it with a synonym because you'll be lying upon Allah. Okay. Uh, now, what's, what you see here is another instance of just that. Uh, so in Surah 2, verse 196, like the Osmanic Quran reads, فَمَنْ كَانَ مِنْكُمْ مَرِيدًا uh, Whereas it says it's أَحَدًا uh, مَنْ changes فَإِنْ كَانَ أَحَدًا مِنْكُمْ مَرِيدًا So they've substituted one phrase. Mm -hmm. uh, then another one in two, Surah 2, 209, جاءكم القدى, جاءكم البينات, Meaning uh, proof versus uh, evidence and signs and guidance. Um, the point what you can see is, it's also interesting what I want to point out is you can see literally every type of variant. You don't just mm -hmm. see small, you see a small, large meaning, you see omissions, additions, substitutions, uh, interpolation, tense changes, like it's like it, it's every type of variant is there. So to argue at this point that this book is perfectly preserved becomes unsustainable. So there is really, I mean, as you can as you can clearly see, there there really is a big hole in the in the oh, narrative. Yeah. There is a major hole. Uh, Abdullah, um, some people have been asking, like, um, if I want to look at this in detail, is there a way I can I can find? Is there like a PDF or something I can find on this? Uh, is there something accessible that I could add to the um, to the description yeah, of this video? Yeah, sure. So what I'll do is uh, after the stream is over, I'll give you the link to both the papers so people can access them and read this all. What I was also going to do was okay. I was going to make this PDF available, like this presentation available for anybody to download mm -hmm. uh, so they can reference it and look into it and read. Uh, so that would be a good, uh, a good way to look into it. But there are, like I said, lots of books uh, uh, written on it. Um, and it is a very deep topic. Mm -hmm. Anyways, fantastic, um, fantastic, fantastic. We uh, see this huge addition. Uh, there's a, I'll just go to a couple of substitutions. Okay, okay. Surah 2, verse 13, Osman says, Fabas, and uh, Sivan says, Fa Arsil, uh, 546, So there's a Baina Yaday is sending for it, Anzalna is revealing. So in Lil Muttaqeen is substituted or Yuktinun. Anzalallah who is substituted with Uhi Allah. Waizara Aitum Waizaja. Um and then like these are even and then these are the one word even more major changes. You can read. I'm not gonna go through all of them. Uh it's too much. At this point, uh one should know that uh the point should be clear that there are extensive variants in every level of, uh, or let's say that every level of the Quranic preservation narrative has some form of flaw in it. But you can see that there's a bunch of interpolation word changes and stuff going on here. Mm -hmm. And on the left side again, on the right side. And uh, there now we are coming to the minor ones here. I'm just gonna skip through them because we've gone through enough minor mm -hmm. ones in the modern mm -hmm. Qurans. So basically there are a lot of uh, variations in the in the Quran and it, it is it is really endless. There are so many, there are numerous examples. So, many. Yeah. so uh, once we finish the manuscripts, now what I want to get to is this phase it shows that the Quranic text evolved and up till Uthman, there were uh, codices by companions that had variations to a great extent. And just to give you an idea of the extent of variation, if we were to read Kitab al uh I hear Ubay had, I think, two extra surahs, Surah Khal and Surah Haft in it. And then, like, uh, um, Ibn Masood had omitted certain things. And then a lot of the variants match, the lower text variants match the variants reported in Kitab al Masahif, which gives credence to the idea that, yes, indeed, there were companion codices available. Now, once we've gotten to that, now we're going to go into the hadith part where we'll analyze uh, how many uh, verses of the Quran were canceled or lost, and that Muhammad himself forget verses, and the Sahaba were fighting amongst each other, mm -hmm. and then there was a book burning. So we'll go through and we'll show you that the compilation process of the Quran itself is 
so flawed and has so much uh, infighting going on that to assert that it is on itself, the committee uh, appointed by Osman did anything uh, to perfectly preserve the Quran, it doesn't stand up to scrutiny. So uh, let's start with this first hadith we have here from Sahih al-Bukhari. Uh, this uh, quickly recounts that uh, there were differences in recitation in the Quran, as now we have seen what those differences were, now we can come back and connect those things. Now we'll start making sense to you, keeping in mind the extent of the variance, why Uthman burnt the Quran. Um, so he makes this copy and whatnot, and then uh, he says to write it in the dialect of the Quraysh, right? And he takes the manuscript from Hafsa and just to fit is that he burns all the copies of the Quran and even fragmentary manuscripts that don't agree with his were burned. So why did Osman burn the Quran? We know now because the, the variation was so extensive, he had to take drastic measures. Now we see that, so, uh, sorry, go ahead. Um, I, I, guess you, I guess you kind of pointed that out and you would like to point, point that out in, uh, further, but uh, Uthman is a, is a very important uh, figure in, in, in Islamic history and um, especially in the history of, of uh, Muhammad. And um, what happens here is that he clearly notices that there are major discrepancies in, uh, between the variations of the Quran and what he orders is to, to unify it and to only leave one single one single version of it to collect all the others and to to, to burn them and um, uh, up until this time it was probably not even um, I, you, you can get to the detail of that but but you see this is basically um, similar to what Yasser Kadi said recently which is that uh, that there are major um, holes in, in the narrative regarding the preservation of the Quran if you talk publicly about these things if you really talk to the average person about these things these these things cause major doubts in the minds of people and uh, the average Muslim apologist doesn't have a reasonable a proper way to explain these things away um, which is why they don't want the average person to speak about it which is why Uthman wants the, wanted the Quran versions to be burned and, and for the and, and there to be only one issue left. If this was such a such a such a minor issue, if this was uh, such a simple thing, such a such a very simple problem that you can just um, easily explain and easily just brush off, and there is nothing much important about that, then they would just do that. They would just have simple explanations to these. But obviously, they're trying to hide it. They're trying to censor it. They're trying to delete parts of. Of, of 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 videos because they openly spoke about these things which happened on Muhammad Hijab's channel and um it's it's really this is really uh, crucial and the average muslim should really sit down and think why is this happening why don't islamic apologists have very easy very uh, easily understandable uh, explanations to these why don't they trust the average muslim why don't they let us look at these variations and just understand them and move on if this is not not such a big deal why are even they making this such a huge deal because it is a big deal, because this completely discredits the Quran. Yeah. Now, uh, one thing I want to point out here is uh, not only the Quran has discrepancies at the level of modern Qurans we saw, we see that it has discrepancy at the manuscript level. Mm -hmm. We are now seeing that the Sahaba had discrepancies in infighting and they're burning the book. While we're going back to Muhammad and how many verses that used to be in the Quran no longer exist. So look at this. Surah Ahzab, which is chapter 33, had over 200 verses, and now it only has 73 verses. So there's about some hundreds of verses that were part of this surah that were gone. They're lost. They were apparently canceled and abrogated. But the whole concept of abrogation even makes the ahruf and qira even worse, and the hole becomes even bigger. It becomes a black hole at that point. <laughs> uh, so... What we see here, there's this hadith has been narrated in literally so many books. What it says is, Ubay bin Kaab is one of the big reciters of the Quran, said to me, how long is Surah Hazab when you read it? How many verses do you think it is? I said to him, 73. He said, only there was a time when it was as long as Surah Al-Baqarah, that's chapter two, the longest chapter in the Quran. And then he says, and he read in it the ayah, the, the, the verse of the stoning. Uh, the old man and the old woman at the commit zina, stone them both, a punishment from Allah. This verse also is no longer found in the Quran. Ibn Hazm says that this is a clearly Sahih Asnad. It is as clear as the sun, which has no fault in it. If you keep reading, Ibn Katsif says similar things as well. But at this point, you're like, okay, the guy just, this surah is missing hundreds of verses. 
And this hadith has been recorded in literally every part. And that's what I'm saying. This is the problem. What happened was, so a lot of these companions would still keep the abrogated verses in their uh, codices. And there's hadiths where Ubay bin Kab would say, Umar said that Ubay recites stuff that he takes from the mouth of the Messenger of Allah, but we do not put that in, uh, in the manuscript and act upon it because it's been canceled. But then there were discrepancies where Ibn Masood and Obey would say, even if the verses are canceled, we are not going to give up our manuscripts. We want to keep those canceled verses in there. So this brings a huge, another layer of doubt on the Quranic preservation. Moving on now, what I want you to see here is the extent of this, the extent of uh, disagreement in the, in the Sahaba, okay? To the point where Abdullah Ibn Masood was had did not like Zayd bin Sabit, the guy appointed by Uthman the Caliph to copy the Mus'haf. And he was so mad that he said to the people, Oh, you Muslim people, I'm removed from the recording of the transcription of the Mus'haf as it is overseen by a man, by Allah. When I accepted Islam, he was but in the loins of a disbelieving man. So Ibn Mas'ud is saying, don't listen to Zayd bin Sabit. He was in the belly, in the loins of a disbelieving man when I was hearing the Qur'an from the mouth of the Prophet. And then Abdullah bin Masood says, O people of Iraq, keep the masahif that are with you and conceal them. For indeed Allah has said, whoever conceals something, he shall come with what he concealed on the day of judgment. So meet Allah with the masahif. Azuri said it was conveyed to me that some men amongst the most virtuous of the companions of the messenger disliked that view of Ibn Masood. So am I, am I understanding this right here, uh, Abdullah? Am I, am I understanding this right here? So we have a Quran. We have uh, the Quran that is revealed um, at a time by uh, Muhammad through revelations that he receives from from Gabriel, and that he speaks to his to his people, to his scribes, and to his uh, to people who, who memorize what he says. And um, up until a certain point, long after Muhammad's death, we have a, a compilation of verses and chapters that people have on their minds and in their and in their books, in their manuscripts. Yet, um, yet there comes a time when when someone, when a, when a, when a specific authority takes over the task to unify the Quran, and uh, and and this person directly invalidates specific versions of the Quran in which a lot of verses are contained that he is against and that he doesn't want in the actual single unified Quran any longer. And that angers somebody who was a scribe and who was someone who listened to Muhammad so much that he says, what the hell? I was there when Muhammad spoke this and I was there and I recorded this. This must be part of the Quran. How can you say it's not part of the Quran? And yet we are left with uh, this specific figure taking the authority and presenting us with a Quran that misses certain uh, certain verses that are that were meant to be in the Quran according to Muhammad. So that is what is happening here. The Quran that we have in our hands, the Quran that I'm having in our hands, is actually missing things that Muhammad said that people heard and that people wrote down. And yet we are being told that the Quran has been uh, revealed at once by Allah, perfectly planned, perfectly reserved, without any human intervention. Here yeah. this. And this is yeah. a completely authentic narration that we are seeing in front of yeah, us. Yeah, it's from a Jama Tirmidhi. Now what we're going to go to is there is, now I'm going to just quickly go through some uh, verses that used to be in the Quran and they no longer exist. So there was the suckling verses and there's 10 sucklings and it was abrogated in another verse. We have five clear sucklings that was gone and now it's no longer found in the Quran anymore again, right? So again, mm -hmm. a few problems here. Now there's this other verse. Uh, here's the one thing you gotta notice. A lot of times the abrogation doesn't make sense, whereas some verses will be uh, having just a spiritual content and they'll be canceled out and they their cancellation or the inclusion in the text doesn't really change much. So mm -hmm. why the hell are you making these changes? And sometimes what happens is, uh, for example, the stoning, right? Why would yeah. Allah cancel and remove the verse but preserve the practice I but always they also about that. also keep the prior verses that were canceled in the quran but the one he has to ask us to act upon is not found in the quran mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so when you think about this a lot of these things don't make sense and half the time these abrogations are so useless uh, but here we see another thing and this is so this guy says we used to recite a chapter which resembled in length and severity to that of Surah Bara, chapter 9. 
I have, however, forgotten it with the exception of this, which I remember out of it. If there were two valleys full of riches for sons of Adam, he would long for a third valley, and nothing will fill the stomach of son of Adam but dust. Uh, this was apparently part of the Quran, and there was a big surah. And it's like a hundred, uh, surah nine, just to give a reference, is a hundred, some almost 200 verses. So there was another surah that had this. So we don't only have surah Ahzab, there's another surah that went missing. Uh, this recounts uh, the same story on the right side, so we'll move to the next one. Now, we talked about uh, the worst of the stoning of adulterers, and the point that I raised was even Omar ibn Khattab is so so concerned that because it's not written down in the Musaf, people will forget about it. And he's like, <laughs> I wish I could have put it in. And then he lets, tells us what the worst actually once was. Al Shaykh was Shaykh is a Zayyan Zaniya Farjamuhuma. So, and if an old man and an old woman commit adultery, stone them both. So we, we see we see that there is a Quran verse. Um, why am I echoing? I don't know why I'm hearing echo. But, uh, so we see that, that there is a Quran verse which has a very explicit, a very clear uh, hudud order, which uh, in Islam stands for um, a punishment or an order that was directly uh, ordained by, by Allah, by Islam, which is to stone adulterers. Uh, we see that this verse is removed from the Quran uh, and is subject of an abrogation. So the original content of the Quran is changed, but the order to to stone adulterers is still part of uh, of Islam. It still has been part of Islam for over a thousand years, and that's what that's what Islamic jurisprudence always went by. So it 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 really doesn't make sense. I have always wondered why did that even why was it even abrogated? I mean, it's it, exactly it was, what and what makes here? even less sense is initially the punishment for women for uh, having four witnesses and being proven that they committed adultery was to put them in their houses till they die. Uh -huh. And this was, I think, in Surah Nasa, verse 15, if I'm correct. But then what happened was the women are like, well, we'll just stay in our houses and we can keep doing dinner. So some people were like, yeah, we can, uh, <laughs> we, we got to change it. So then the flogging was introduced, right? Uh -huh. But then there was the stoning wars. So the stoning worse canceled out the flogging worse in, in a certain sense. Uh, and then uh, also the uh, pushing women into their houses till they die. But the cancel verses are still part of the Quran. But the worst we need to follow isn't part of the Quran. It makes no sense. So I'm sorry. What this looks like to me is, um, is there was an order in the original Quran, uh, which was to punish people by just uh, putting them, confining them into their homes. Uh, then Muslims further made up thought that this doesn't really work, so they made up the rule to flog people, and then maybe Muhammad even died, and they made they made a rule up about about or a Quran verse about stoning people who commit adultery. But then they thought, oh, this shouldn't be part of the Quran. We shouldn't put this in the Quran, so they didn't put it in the Quran. Although they still still continued this practice because they were uh, rough and barbaric people who thought that that should be a good punishment, and yet they couldn't put it into the Quran. And yet the and yet the law has been followed by Muslims forever. So. <laughs> I know, a Muslim should really sit down and, and, and ask Think himself, about like, it. what the hell is happening here? Uh, what, what went wrong in Islamic history? <laughs> <laughs> the Quranic preservation is slowly turning into a massive black hole at this point. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's funny. Uh, again, this is just a quick, I'll go over this. Like I said earlier, there's verses that were revealed where uh, the verse used to recite, inform our people that we have met our Lord, he's pleased with us and he has made us pleased. And later on, this Quranic verse was canceled. Uh, the hadith on the right says the same thing again why was this verse cancelled i mean it doesn't really change anything if it's yeah. included or not it makes no sense this is an interesting one uh so this there's many hadith about this is that there's a verse in the quran 2 to 38 where it says ala was salat al uh, but aisha said that there's an extra phrase in here and she added the phrase wa salatul asr i think is how it ends but what we see here again is uh, why is this phrase initially added but then removed? And if you actually go into the detail of this thing, you will then have sahabas in hadith and tasdeeb say, oh, but the Salatul Wusta referred to Salatul Asr. So Salatul Asr was removed because it was redundant. Mm -hmm. So it's, 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 it's that too. Uh, let's go on to this other one. And now here's the, this is an interesting one. Uh, the current Quran has the Syrian reading as per this hadith. The current Quran reads, 
This story is that there was a Sahabi that went to Syria and he asked for somebody who could recite like Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. And then he asked, how do you recite Surah Layl, Surah 92, well, Layl is Ayyavsha. And uh, the guy said that I heard uh, him recite, well, Layl is Ayyavsha, they skip the second verse because it, it's a given it's there. But Zakari wal Untha. So he skips Wama Khalaqa part. Then Abu Darda said, by Allah, this is how I heard the messenger of Allah reciting it. But these people want me to recite it, but I will not follow them. So now we have a hadith that is saying that the Quran you see right now is not what should be part of it. So, so <laughs> what we have here again, dear, uh, dear, dear Muslim listeners, is that, um, is, is that, is that, Clearly, the Muslims after Muhammad are, are arguing uh, with each other about on how to uh, read a Quran, on what the actual text of the Quran is. Although we have always learned that the Quran was directly uh, revealed by Allah through weird uh, states of revelation to Muhammad in this in a, in a perfect way. So I'll leave that to you. <laughs> Uh, so just uh, there's a few hadith about this as well. Muhammad also admitted in the Quran where it says uh, that uh, Muhammad used to forget the Quran. I actually reported the messenger of Allah listened to the recitation of the Quran by a man in the mosque. Thereupon he said, may Allah have mercy upon him. He reminded me of the worst which I had been made to forget. Made to forget. <laughs> well, there's, yeah, they think like... Uh, uh, Allah will make you forget, you know, like it's, they have to have the supernatural because they have to justify the abrogation cancellation. <laughs> so <laughs> a lot of the abrogated, okay, here's the thing. A lot of the abrogated verses were so lost that people just forgot them, right? So now he's thinking, okay, I, if, if I forgot the verses, I need to make an excuse. Oh, I'll reveal a verse that in the Quran says, Allah will make you forget the Quran. And then it'll replace it with new ones. There you go. Problem solved. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry, my dog is really is really bothering me. He's asking for a lot of affection for for some reason tonight. He's getting um, noises. Uh, don't, don't we have don't we have a um, we have a we have a Quran verse about it, or we have several Quran verses, right? In which in which the Quran itself says something like uh, it responds to critics because critics are accusing Muhammad of, of making things up or of saying things in a different way or of hmm. inventing new things. And then the Quran responds to them and says, uh, it's, it says, if we cause a verse to be forgotten, uh, we replace it with a, with a better, more beautiful verse or something like that. So the Quran actually directly addresses this issue yeah. and tries to make excuses for that. Yeah, there's two verses on abrogation in the Quran itself. I think Surah 2 verse 106 is one of them. Uh -huh. I, don't, I can't remember the other one. So we are almost at the end of the presentation. Okay. But this will show you these two hadith that how Muhammad is making stuff up as he went along. So on the left side, we see, and just, just to realize here, one thing to take home is how uh, literalistic and let's say the Sahaba were. Uh, and so you see this, uh, uh, Allah reveal a verse that talks about when to stop eating when you're starting you're fast, right? So the words initially, the initial revelation read, and eat and drink until the white thread appears to you distinct. Now, from the black thread, Allah is metaphorically talking about the light in the sky, okay? But initially, the verse did not have the phrase of dawn in it. So what ended up happening was these Sahabis, they were literalistic to a certain such an extent they actually started tying threads to their legs and then they would be eating and then be looking out and like oh yeah i can see the the black now and the white now oh stop eating <laughs> i'm not joking and that's why allah was like oh no i need to make a an addendum to this verse to clarify what it actually meant so he revealed an additional phrase <laughs> off dawn this, these are the people we are supposed to take take knowledge and wisdom from so <laughs> <laughs> now on the right side a similar occurrence happened this one's hilarious so uh to summarize uh, a verse is revealed not equal are those of the believers who sit at home okay and then muhammad's like hey call this guy to bring something to write it down so muhammad tells him to write down the verse okay now he doesn't notice that there's a blind man sitting behind muhammad 
and he hears the worst and he says oh prophet i am blind so what about him because the worst says not equal are those believers who sit at home so then muhammad's like oh oh i forgot to mention the disabled people so then he says with an addendum again so there was revealed in place of that worst the worst not equal are those of the believers who sit at home except those who are disabled so here we see that Muhammad had a revelation and then this guy's like, hey, uh, what about blind people or disabled people? He's like, oh, I forgot. I'll add this to it. Like, <laughs> yeah. so, so, so Muhammad, Muhammad is standing there and he's having a, a revelation from Allah because Allah is currently revealing verses to him and uh, about something very important, which is that you should go and fight because uh, never could be uh, the person who fights and the person who doesn't fight be um the same and then someone is behind him and says but i can't fight i'm disabled what about me and then he's like oh uh, allah also says uh, except the disabled ones and then, and then the guy is like oh good good thank you allah yeah. <laughs> i mean yeah quite literally that's what happened so this is now the last slide i'm gonna show you and just before we get to that last slide i'm about to tell you something very important you are about to see the muslim defense the the save it all card. After this whole presentation, seeing variants on every level of the Quran and problems in every part and of the narrative and every step of the standard narrative, we now get to what Muslims propagate as the save it all uh, to make sense of all of this is this hadith. So let's read it together. Um, so narrated Umar ibn Khattab, I heard. Hisham bin Hakim bin Hizam reciting Surah Al Furqan in a way different to that of mine. Allah's Messenger had taught it to me in a different way, so I was about to quarrel with him during the prayer. Just if I, this is Omar, so just read what happens next. But I waited till he finished. Then I tied his garment around his neck and seized him by it and brought him to the Messenger of Allah. So Omar has this guy and he's dragging him to Muhammad and said, I have heard him recite Surah Furqan in a different way to the way you taught it to me. The Prophet ordered me to release him and asked Hisham to recite it. He recited it and Allah said it was revealed this way. Then he asked me to recite it and I recited it and he said it was revealed in this way too. The Quran has been revealed in seven different ways to recite in the way that is easier for you. That is what oh. the Muslim position is to make sense of all of these discrepancies and variants that Allah revealed it in seven ways. So th think about it. Think about it. Uh, very simply, think about it. Th uh, let's 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 allow, for example, let's allow for for one second, for one moment, the notion that Muhammad might have just uh, made everything up. And of course, because he made things up, he uh, you know he he said things differently to different people because he's making up things from his memory and he can't always perfectly uh, remember the things that he says which is why he says something in a certain way to this guy and in a different way to this other guy now muslims say that the quran was uh, perfectly preserved and, uh, and and perfectly revealed and it has been uh, you know that the quran did exist before the existence of time and it will exist until uh, until the end of time or forever it, it will exist forever. So um, we would now, as critics of Islam, come out and say, um, well, if there are two versions of the Quran, if the Quran, um, if, if there are discrepancies between the Qurans, there are two different versions, they obviously read differently. Doesn't this mean that the Quran wasn't actually, uh, you know, perfectly revealed and perfectly preserved? Mm -hmm. So we, we, we could then point out, this is actually one proof, one, uh, one one piece of evidence that Muhammad was a liar and that Muhammad did make up things as he went along, but what would Muhammad? What, but what would Muslims say then? They would say, "Well, uh, let's ask Muhammad. What does Muhammad say about this?" And what Muhammad says is, uh, "Well, there are seven different kinds of Islam of, of the Quran, and just recite it the way you like it." And Muslims come and say, "See, our Prophet already answered the question. Great." <laughs> so. You would normally, looking at, it, at this from a very reasonable perspective, find a flaw in this, a hole in the narrative, and say this clearly shows that Muhammad was inconsistent and that Muhammad made things up. 
But a Muslim has to believe in Islam. It has to believe that Muhammad was perfect. It has to believe that Muhammad was always inspired by Allah, which is why the, 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 the Muslim will not accept your criticism and will simply accept a very terrible excuse that Muhammad uh, makes as a clear explanation that your evidence is invalidated because Muhammad already had an explanation to it. Already, although the explanation makes no sense because there is really no point for the Quran to be written and recited in different ways, in seven different ways, which uh, be based on comfort. There is no, there is really no point for that to happen. Yeah. The Quran is being recited in all kinds of cultures all around the world today. And you can recite it in one way and it completely makes sense in that way. There is no point for that to be to, yeah. to differ from person to person or from people to people. So, What's interesting is that there is such a huge difference of opinion on what the ahruf is, because like you said, it's so vague, right? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So there's about 40 different opinions of Islamic scholars and what the ahruf are, right? So uh, they go, they vary. So some say that the ahruf, the seven, isn't actually the number seven. Uh, mm -hmm. It's actually a metaphor used in the Arabic like 770, 700 to show abundance, variation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So then you're like, okay, well, if there's not a set number, then how many variants do exist? Like I said, 7, 10, 14, 36. There's no objective measure. And remember that the Quran never stipulates variants in its own text. It's always externally used, right? Now then, a lot of the problems occur is, okay, are the ahruf equivalent or interchangeable with the Qur'an, yani the revayas of the Qur'an, meaning the different readers who transmitted the Qur'an. So some people will say, no, the Qur'an and the Ahruf are different, okay? So then, all, then you ask, okay, well, are the Ahruf dialects or do they also encompass the textual variants? Do they encompass the textual variants that exist in the post-Osmanic modern Qur'ans or do they encompass also the companion codices that were found in the lower text of Sana, right? So once you start thinking about it, 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 it completely crumbles. It, the thing has, it cannot make sense because <laughs> every angle you look at it, if you try to fit this, uh, this ahruf into one aspect, problems emerge in the other aspect of the preservation narrative, right? Now what's also uh, important is the theology of it and how it ties into that. So like we were talking about earlier, Allah has a corresponding copy of the Quran in heaven, according to the Quran, in Lohe Mahfuz, Umul Kitab. Now I'm seriously, after all this evidence, I'm confused. Okay, does that Quran up in heaven have the modern Quran variants? Did it have the companion codices? That it, it still have the abrogated canceled verses? If it's the eternal speech of Allah, does that mean that the canceled verses now somehow unbecome the eternal speech of Allah? Um, there are so many questions. And at this point, at the end of it, when you think about this, it is very clear that this hadith is most probably, this ahruf hadith was most probably concocted a few decades or a century later after Muhammad. Mm -hmm as a post hoc rationalization because the Muslims started realizing, oh shit, we got to find an explanation. And they came up with this and it was purposefully left vague. And what's interesting is even Muhammad Hijab on his Twitter said that the concept of Ahruf makes the Quran preservation claim unfalsifiable, right? And if you say that, then there it's just an article of faith. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're saying that you're not gonna uh, except any of you can show them any variant to any extent and they'll say oh it's the ahruf yeah right so that's, that's what i'm saying when you would you would look at it, uh, at it critically and you would say um well this is clear proof that there is a discrepancy a flaw in the whole narrative that the quran was uh, perfectly preserved but uh but the muslim simply refers to a to a to a tradition to a report that uh, emerged a um, 100 years after Muhammad died, which says, well, there, is, there are different variations of the Quran. Mm -hmm. And a Muslim simply brings up that and says, well, um, even if there are discrepancies between the ver versions of the Quran, uh, there is already an explanation to that, which is that, uh, that there are different kinds of the Quran that simply serve to read it uh, more comfortably. So the, you, you really can't make sense of it. You really cannot defeat the Muslim position, the Muslim uh, apologetics by simply bringing up a simple, a very simple, a very uh, 
a, a very simple criticism completely based on common sense which proves that it is that it simply that it simply doesn't work and th that's why I mean, from the beginning i was trying to point out that uh, the quran's claim is that it was that it is the speech of god of, of allah it is the word of god of allah that it uh, coexisted with allah i mean there were there were even if you want to go back into the into the theological discussions of of islam in the first centuries it was a there was so much controversy going on because people were fighting each other uh, islamic scholars were fighting each other over whether the quran was created by allah through his speech or whether it was uncreated and always existed with allah so um um, that that is that is still uh, to to certain extents a major discussion in Islam. But what you get from it is that uh, is that it is a fundamental teaching, a fundamental doctrine of Islam, a fundamental claim of Islam that the Quran, uh, which we read, is something that is that that belongs to Allah, that belongs to Allah's eternity, that has always existed with Him, and that it will always exist with Him up there on the on His in His in His giant major book. So when you read the Quran, when I open this book and, and read its letters, then I'm directly exactly. reading. I'm reading directly a copy of of what Allah has with Himself. But if these but if these Quran Quran books have differences, if if these have letter differences, symbol differences, if they have differences in in how much uh, in, in 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 verse numbers, if entire verses, entire chapters are missing, then what exactly is this a copy of? Then this can't be a copy of what is up there. If this is the copy of what is up there, then then what exactly was revealed to Muhammad when Allah was revealing it to Muhammad? And why did Allah reveal what He was revealing to Muhammad? It did. It doesn't make any sense. It simply, it's, yeah, it is, it is flawed. It's, it's so flawed. And like I said, at this point, like uh, before, uh, one other criticism I want to add on the ahruf is the ahruf hadith never defines what constitutes a variant that will be classified as ahruf and a mistake. Mm -hmm. We have no distinctive framework given to us by the Quran or the Hadith to decipher, okay, this problem or this variant is more likely to be a scribal error versus being a revealed part of the Quran. Mm -hmm. So what I'm trying to say is actually scribal errors have pro most probably like we saw became part of the Quranic recitation, but Muslims didn't realize that they're actually reciting an error and not the speech of God, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So there is that too. Uh, but at the end of this, it, this concludes the presentation. And I would say that it is uh, absolutely uh, near impossible, absurd, and irrational at this point to assert that the Quran is perfectly dot to dot, word by word, letter to letter. It, it, you just cannot sustain that proposition at all whatsoever in academia. You just froze, but I believe you said preserved. So <laughs> you just froze. But uh, I believe what you were saying is that it is absolutely, it is not, it is not possible to claim at this point that the Quran was perfectly preserved. I would completely agree. I mean, um, as a as a Muslim, you learn um, it might not make sense to people of other religions. It might not make sense to a Christian or a Jew, for example. And it uh, it definitely makes much less sense to a Hindu or a Buddhist or all or all the uh, other religious groups. But uh, to a Muslim, it is a very big claim that the Quran is, uh, quote unquote, um, the the only book that hasn't been changed or the only book that that has been perfectly preserved and um to to, to Christians and Jews, it, that that statement doesn't really make sense that the average Christian and Jew thinks uh, so what? Because because Christians and Jews don't have the doctrine that they are meant to have a book that has been. Uh, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> David would just said, "Ha ha!" He froze. The great God Allah silenced him. <laughs> stop, <laughs> stop distracting me, David. Uh, um, God, where was I going? So the Christians and Jews don't have this claim that <laughs> that they are meant to have a book that was perfectly preserved, perfectly uh, spoken by the Almighty God, and that can never be changed until the end of time. Because according to the Jews and Christians, they simply have a a message. They have a collection, a, a giant compilation of reports that people wrote down, partly inspired, partly uh, partly directly uh, inspired by God to uh, word for word what to write, but in, in other parts simply written by people and then organized as a holy book, simply to read 
read what is being said, you know, what happened in the past, what is there to learn, not exactly word for word what is right and what is wrong, you know, because th that is a Quranic Islamic concept. And that Quranic Islamic concept obviously doesn't work, which is why... Uh, which is why we have this problem, which is why we have huge variations, which is why Islamic scholars come up with the excuse that this was actually deliberate, that there was actually a reasoning behind it, that there was actually a point behind it, a point that doesn't make any sense to anybody. Because as said, and there is no way that you can refute this claim, that you can refute this analysis, that we are so many cultures today in this world, and everybody can read the same Quran, can maintain the same Quran, can recite the same Quran, and it is easily recitable for everybody in the world. There really is no, 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 no point, no importance to having different versions of the Quran at all, let alone forget about the recitations, forget about the, the mistakes, forget about the, the, little, the little letter issues. Mm -hmm. Having entire, uh, entire discrepancies and entire chapters and entire verses. I, um, there was, there was even the problem. Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, uh, there's one thing I wanted to add that the surah order is very highly disputed as well. That too, that too. Not just the verse numbering. If you were to read al fahrist and the orders, they are vividly off. Even sometimes the verses occur in different sequences. So the point is, that, again, this comes back to the claim with the linguistic precision of the Quran and the miracle of the 19 and stuff. Actually, I'll just give you one quick example to give you an idea. So. Uh, Take a Nomali Khan example, we have made you the middle nation, right? It mm -hmm. occurs, uh, this verse occurs in verse 143 of Surah Baqarah, okay? And he says that Surah Baqarah has 286 verses, therefore it occurring in the middle is a miracle. But what he fails to realize is that apart from the Hafs tradition, the Vash does not count up to 286 verses, it's 287 or 288, so the miracle doesn't work, right? <laughs> So you have to selectively cherry pick certain versions of the Quran to make certain numerical miracles work, right? This one other point. Uh huh. Correct me if I'm wrong. Isn't there an entire issue with the with the with the ninth chapter of the Quran with Surah Tawbah? There was a uh, I don't know if you mentioned it earlier, but um, the, there there is a narration about about that entire chapter, which is that uh, as the people were putting the Quran together, you know, it, it was a huge pro pro process in which. Um, uh, Zaid was going around and was trying to collect all the different uh, all the different notes that exist uh, about the Quran and all the different oral traditions that exist about the Quran and he was trying to put it together and people had that one chapter which was uh, chapter 9 uh, which is which also happens to be the most brutal the most violent chapter well, in the Quran interesting is um, chapter 9 is the last chapter revealed to yeah you. the last chapter Muhammad died I mean uh, the, the the hadith I think uh, as far as I remember goes that he um, he was reciting that chapter he was revealing Revealing that chapter, and shortly after he revealed that chapter, he died, and he never told them what happens to that chapter, what what is supposed to happen to that. So the the, the people um, wanted to add it to the end of a different chapter, but uh, what they instead did was to just uh, make it a separate chapter, and uh, and that chapter doesn't start with uh, with a with Bismillah rahman rahim which is at the beginning of every other Quran of every Quran chapter. So the an entire chapter was just uh, arbitrarily planted into the Quran uh, without any instructions, without anything. And the, the Muslim followers of Muhammad just did that. So when you read the Quran and you come to chapter 9, you are just you, you are just looking at a chapter that, that Muhammad uh, randomly uh, revealed to people, but he never further gave any instructions about it. And the Muslims just thought, well, what, what are we going to do with this chapter? This sounds like that chapter. Let's just put it here. You know, that's what you're looking at. So it is completely an arbitrarily organized book with no order, uh, no proper value, obviously no no proper pres preservation. I mean, I, I haven't even delved into the Shia perspective, because I, just to give you an idea that oh, yeah. what I showed you was just the major variants. There's mm -hmm. upwards of about a thousand oral variants. I have a Quran, it's a Mus'haf, with all the 10 uh, variants listed in the margin. I kid you not, there is not a single page in that book almost without a variant on it. Mm -hmm. A lot of the variants are oral, so uh, they still have sometimes affect the meaning, but there's so many. And then she is uh, alleged the Quran has been changed and there's many surahs and whatnot. And this has been an ongoing debate in the, uh, between Shias and Sunnis about the tahrif of the Quran, right? So this isn't something new that's being brought mm -hmm. forth. It's just that it's being so shielded. This this knowledge isn't provided to the average Muslim, and now we know why because this is so damaging. Yeah, yeah. That is from God.
this is why this is such a big issue. I mean, the average Muslim doesn't know any of this. The average Muslim never learns about this because uh, this issue is considered very controversial and very sensitive, uh, which is why the the Muslim scholars don't want the average Muslim to be confronted with this issue so that they uh, so that their faith is not shaken, which is now going on in the, in the Muslim world. Gladly, I'm so happy about that. <laughs> so that, that's why, why why it's so important for us to to bring out these truths and to show to the average Muslim what really went wrong with the history. Uh, Correct me if I'm if I'm uh, wrong, but the Shia perspective is that um, is is that they acknowledge that mostly that uh, that the Quran that we hold in our hands was organized like this by the by by the by the by the by the Sahaba by the by the Khalifs, uh, and 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 the Shia Muslims don't really uh, don't really acknowledge don't really recognize the Quran as it has been organized as it ha as it has been eventually finalized but over time they just uh, went along with it and they just used it anyway so to so to not be uh, branded as 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 deviants and as heretics and and kufar and, and because there is there is not much that they could else yeah. do about it and so <laughs> i think about the shia thing i just had a variant pop into my head that i just forgot to mention this point earlier in the stream is there's have you noticed that when Shias do wudu, they don't wash their feet; they just rub their hand on the foot. Versus Sunnis, I'm aware of it. Yeah, I, I, I there's a variant in the verse of the wudu verse. I think it's uh, uh, something to do with arjulikum and uh, arjulakum, something like that. Where one variant uh, reads to wash the feet, and one reads to like to just moisten the feet. And this variant actually lead to the whole uh, bifurcation between the Shia and Sunni about the voodoo. Now, what's also interesting is that uh, Dr. Uh, Ramon Harvey, uh, academic, uh, he wrote a paper on Ibn Masood's readings that survived uh, and were used to form legal rulings in the Hanafi madhab, meaning that the scholars were actually seeing the variant readings of Ibn Masood as authentic and going off basing legal rulings off of that. So that's one point I wanted to make as well. Um, but I was wondering now that since we've kind of wrapped up all of this, if there's any questions or any any. Uh, I could go into that. Yeah, I will. I will. I will yeah, quickly no. go through the the super chats, especially. I would never want to just let them hang around here. Uh, quickly, David David Wood just asked, uh, "Does Abdullah Gondal have a YouTube channel?" Uh, I don't have a YouTube channel myself, but I do uh, come on and off on uh, Abdullah Samir's channel and uh, other uh, YouTube channels like Haris Sultan. Mm -hmm. uh, but I am working towards my own YouTube channel. It's just like uh, very busy with school and uh, life and the pandemic and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But I've been trying to work on it for over a year. So <laughs> you should go on. You should go on David Wood's channel. Yeah, yeah too. Definitely. You should, I should be a guest on his channel. I'm advertising you here directly. <laughs> I'm doing a great service to everybody. Uh, um, okay, super chats. Hindu historian made a super chat at the beginning. Uh, didn't say anything. Just uh, posted a sticker with uh, thumbs. Uh, Hindu historian also made a super chat earlier and said, "Truth alone triumphs." I agree. Thank you for always being here. Krisanti P said, "Keep it up." Thank you. Abdullah Samir made a super chat and said, "Abdullah Kundal is a big shaitan." Uh, <laughs> I'm on a suit, the big gin. <laughs> oh, good, good, good. Wonderful acknowledgements here. Perfect for the list for the average Muslim listener to relate to us and to <laughs> to, see, to see goodness in us. Uh, Act 17 of uh, David Wood obviously made a super chat earlier and said, "I'm starting to think that there might be some holes in the narrative." Uh, <laughs> Sayyid Ibrahim made a super chat and said, "There are so many Qurans like Hafs, Walsh, Husseini, Sana, Samarkandi. Then why do Muslims say that the Quran is preserved?" Exactly. So that was yeah. the entire entire point of this uh, of this chat. I would actually, after this, I would maybe like to make a little bit, uh, maybe make a short uh, bite sized video just about this topic mm -hmm. uh, with your references. I would like to maybe shorten this live stream because oh, yeah. I think this is very this is invaluable and this should be viewed. Uh, easily by the average Muslim too. And people tend to watch shorter things uh, better, so I will definitely do that. Yeah, Solitary Emmy made a super sticker. Thank you, Solitary Emmy, I appreciate it. Hadi Rafurian made a super chat uh, without any comments. Introverted Smiles Hello. made a super chat. Hello, Introverted Smiles. And said, Allah has a hard time remembering when quoting people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Zigzag made a super chat and uh, just posted a unicorn. That's a super sticker, I believe. 
<laughs> Adolfo Madrid made a super chat and said, AP, you are awesome. Thank you so much, Adolfo Madrid. I appreciate it. And Anita V said, AP and Abdullah, much respect to your integrity. Thank you. Nadaver said, great stream as usual, Ridvan. I mean, Abdullah's superior and very much twirl-worthy mustache alone is worthy of a live stream <laughs> with his extensive knowledge coming in at a close second. <laughs> Uh, Sayyid Ibrahim made a super chat saying that the only prophet I follow is a positive prophet. Of course, uh, you don't want to be stoned, right? Uh, B. Demirbash made a super sticker, which I appreciate very much. Thank you. No comment added, but thank you so much. No, there are no questions here. No one is asking questions. Okay. Uh, wait, wait, I'll go ahead. Uh, Zigzag said, please discuss Dan Gibson and Tom Holland's findings. Also, check Adam El Masri's channel. He's a religious historian. The channel is in Arabic, but I think you'll be very interested in, in what he has to say. Uh, do you know about Dan Gibson's work? or uh, I, I have looked at his work. Um, like I said, in, in all honesty, they, uh, academia doesn't take his theory uh, seriously. Uh, although like he, he has, uh, has pointed out to some evidences, but acad academics have said that it's not taken as seriously. How dare you, how dare you say that? <laughs> I'll just say that. <laughs> I hope that answers it is the an interesting theory, though. Like, it definitely is very interesting. You mean the whole Petra issue, right? The, yeah, yeah. Uh, Mecca Petra. was Petra. The, yeah, I, um, the, so pe people keep bringing that up to me, and I, I responded quite a few times to that. I said, um, I said I don't really buy it. I find it. I find it. Uh, I kind of find it. I, I find that 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 narrative has holes in it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, but I believe when I look at the the, the documentary and the findings about uh, that the original Mecca was actually Petro, I see a lot of discrepancies about that. I actually, I made a lot of notes and thought I should maybe make a brief video on why I don't think that that is a plausible explanation. Like one of the explanations is that a certain um, is is that certain hadiths are quoted, but then uh, uh, as supporting evidence that Mecca was actually Petra. But then there are hadith on a similar level that clearly talk about uh, about Desert. Medina, Medina mm -hmm. with its name, for example, mm -hmm. with its original name, and uh, and 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 you just cannot reconcile those two things. You exactly. cannot at the same time claim that that this is this refers obviously to Petra, but then completely dismiss hadith that obviously talk about the the region, you know, the 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 the, the Hijaz region. Yeah. But mm -hmm. go ahead. What? Yeah, the one thing like you said that there would be hadith saying that all oh, these gardens and gardens these Sahabas had, and he's like, oh, Mecca yeah. didn't have any gardens, but then he wouldn't mention the hadith about the deserts and the dates and all that, right? So, yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, but it's a very complicated topic. I don't know if yeah. I ever want to go into that. But um, Super Chat by Zuhair Nakvi said, uh, have there been any findings of entire verses or chapters added or removed? I believe this question came before we went into that, but we actually addressed that issue during the... Yeah, uh, there two. are, uh, like, if you were to read uh, Kitab al-Masahib and said, it's, it's scandalous. Like, it's got insane amount <clears throat> of variations. What we're hoping to find is if we can actually find a companion codice, let's say if we can actually find Ibn Masud's Quran, it's game over, mm -hmm. right? I mean, the, the, the Sana Quran itself, the lower text, was also very uh, much, they, like, they've argued, as a companion codex too. Uh, but yeah, I mean, there are a lot of variations that uh, will come up to light. And also just to let you know that uh, I, were, I was talking to academics that are leading the research on the Sana Quran, and they said that not all of the folios have been surveyed. Some of the folios are still not handing them over. And I don't know why, but this find has been around since the 70s. And when was the Sana one published? In like 2011 by uh, the scholars, the paper reference. So just to show you that there's a lot of politics and all sort of that plays into it. So wait, hopefully we'll find one day uh, an Ibn Masood Quran. That would, be, that would be gold. One day, until that day. Uh, we all have to believe that the Quran has been perfectly preserved uh, and believe in Allah with all our heart, despite all the evidence that clearly already points against it. One thing is, but, I, I find it hilarious as a Muslims and a Yazrukadi said too, like, uh, we just say that the Quran is preserved because the Quran says the Quran is preserved in Surah 15, verse 9. That's that, not how you go about these things. That's <laughs> the logic, dude. Like, that, that is circular reasoning. Yeah. yeah, the Quran has been preserved because the Quran says that it has been perfectly preserved. 
which means the ground has been perfectly preserved because the ground says it has perfectly that that is that is a prime example yeah, of circular exactly. reasoning. So it doesn't work. That is th that's something you do because you have to believe that that Islam is the truth, and there is no other way that, that you you cannot possibly uh, take any evidence against that fundamental belief that the, that yeah. Islam is the absolute truth. Um, Super chat by Michael Gellimore said, "Are there any variations with the Zemzem well story?" Oh, um, the whole story. I mean, how the Zemzem water well started. I don't think it ever was. True. There's not much detail to it anyway. Yeah, so it's, it's not like uh, if you were to read the like the Ibn Ishaq or Tabiri or other books like the Sira books, then they go into these wilder claims. Uh, but paganism and actually these rituals have a pagan origin. Uh, like Mufti Abulais even talked about mm -hmm. a few of these too, but that's another topic, yeah. I made a, I made a big video about that, which uh, I still look at. I, I, I was in a great mood when I made that. I call it the Zamzam the Zam -Zam, uh, Zam -Zam water craziness or something like that. I don't know. I, I made something like that like, a, like, a, like two years ago. Uh, please go watch it. It's very nice. I started it with the joke that I'm uh, with a little skit where I was uh, uh, wiping myself with stems and water, <laughs> which, is, which you're not supposed to do. Mm. Uh, I don't know why I'm doing such things. B. Demirbash made a super chat and said, uh, Ridwan, does he know Dr. Sami Aldeep from Switzerland? Dr. Aldeep is coming from weekly to Gig TV. That's a Turkish uh, YouTube channel, a Turkish atheist YouTube channel, and revealing the errors of the Qurans, especially lo linguistic errors. He also has his own YouTube channel in Arabic and French. Do you know about uh, Dr. No. Sami Aldeep? No, no, I do not. Interesting potential guest. I will make a note of that and possibly. Yeah, that would see. be cool. Yeah, yeah. You could actually. Uh, I could bring you two together. You could. You could endlessly talk about this boring topic. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm just kidding. Uh, about this crucial topic. Uh, Saint Miles made a super chat and said, "Bacon, bacon, bacon." To all the Muslim trolls on this chat, your eyes have touched bacon. Now you will dream of eating it. Since you are Actually, looking at the super chat, you will also be touched by a used. No. Come on. <laughs> I also just remember, just uh, it just popped in my head that the famous Quran verse about the sun setting in the muddy, the sun setting in the pond, that mm -hmm. verse also has a variant. Really? Yeah. So the variant is Hamia and Hamia. It's how it's pronounced. And it means like either a muddy spring or a black spring of boiling water. So that's mm -hmm. the thing. Mm -hmm. uh, so they say that if the sun goes in, it makes it boil and it's dark mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. adds up. Uh, what's also ironic is the verse that says the Quran is preserved, Surah 15, verse 9, the verse preceding it, Surah 15, verse 8, we saw it, it had a variant in it. Hilarious. The irony. <laughs> <laughs> that, is, that is so ridiculous. I, yeah. I, don't, I don't even know where to start with this. Hindu story made a super sticker. Hindu story made another super sticker. Bruce Wayne made a super sticker. Thank you so much. I appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you. I'm going to, there are a lot of super chats. What is happening here? <laughs> uh, Hubert Farnsworth made a super chat and said, "What is your thought on why the Sana manuscript had a lower text different than the more recent text on the same parchment paper?" Yeah. Uh, so, uh, like we discussed, it was a companion codex, and over time, when these uh, companion codices and the discrepancies were evolving. Uh, Caliph Osman decided, no, we have to destroy the Qur'ans that disagree. So uh, what ends up happening is what a palm says, that the parchment isn't easy to make. It's like killing a lot of animals. It's basically animal skin, right? So a lot of the times, uh, instead of destroying the parchment, they rub it off to reuse it. And instead of this time, what, it ha what seems to have happened that Osman's new, the canonized Quran was written on top of this old companion codex that was rubbed off. That's the theory that has been put forth by quite a few academics and is one of the most leading serious theories uh, that, that about the Sana palimpsest. Wonderful, wonderful. It, it's, it just gets more problematic for mm -hmm. Islam. Uh, Zuhair Nakvi made another super chat and said, I would request a review of In Search of Ali ibn Talib's Codex by Saif ad Kara from Mr. Gandal. I think it offers a unique perspective to the discussion. So are you there, of... there are, actually, I remember now, I researched this topic two years ago. There is a Turkish scholar who came out with new Quran that he said uh, matched the 
variants recorded not only the manuscripts but in the hadith and the rivayas and he has these codices for Abu Bakr and then uh, Uthman and Ali like you said I think that the scholar you just named I think that is the person I'm not uh, might I'm be not. might be I, I see that he has uh, had a past with um, a yeah it's, it's probably it probably answers the question. Uh, Veiba Chaudhary said, uh, "How do you, how do you say that?" Chaudhary. Chaudhary. Okay. Yeah. Said, uh, "Why Allah? I don't know how you people speak." Uh, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Don't don't be offended. Uh, Veiba Chaudhary said, "Why Allah? Is, why is Allah so needy?" <laughs> <laughs> Saint Miles made a super chat and said, "Great program and intelligent conversation. Thank you. I really I really mm -hmm. agree. I think this uh, this topic has been very." Um, very good, very valuable. There is a lot to do with this. I definitely want to, want to um, snippets out of the video. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I want to, I want to make maybe two different uh, references to this video afterwards in the, in the following days. I would uh, just make uh, my type of video under ten minutes to summarize what's going on mm. here. Yeah. Uh, and then I would also like to take this this live stream and just. Uh, really shorten it or or take little bits to make it watchable for the average viewer and especially also for the average muslim viewer because i think this is a very important topic that needs to be processed that needs to be uh talked about needs to be watched mm -hmm. and i really appreciate that how you have been how you have handled this abdullah i really thank you big big respect Quickly, Veba Chaudhary made another super chat and said, uh, love from India, and another super chat and said, please take my name, love from India. I did. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. Okay, that's that's all uh, to the super chats. Um, okay. I think it's been, uh, it's been on for about two hours. I think that's uh, good. You already, you already want to go? We, we have, we're just we're just starting. Oh, man, I'm so tired. I, I, for those who don't know, this is like uh, my third live stream uh, in 24 hours. <laughs> I, I don't. I don't care. The night has just begun. We have to. Oh, okay. uh, we have to. We have to go through this. No, just kidding. Um, of course, you're obviously very tired. You have uh, put a lot of effort into this. I really appreciate it. I uh, love that. Thanks for having me, man. It was it was an honor. And I mean, uh, you reach such a big audience. So, like I said, uh, seeing that you brought me on, like I really thank you for that. Appreciate for that. And then. Uh, Hopefully, like this topic and the timing of this, uh, hopefully keeps opening the eyes of people that the hole keeps getting bigger. And uh, I hope, I, I keep hoping that this becomes common knowledge to every Muslim. Mm -hmm. Because, like, we are, like, every, you can go to a mosque or go to do a survey of a mosque at a Juma prayer outside and ask the Muslims, is the Quran preserved? They'll tell you, yes, only one Quran and everything. 90% of the people, if not. Uh, but till then, uh, that's all from my side. It was a pleasure uh, being here uh, and uh, discussing this topic. If, uh, like I said, if there's anything you uh, you want for the references, we will leave them in the link below. I will upload all these slides uh, freely accessible so people can spread this information. And uh, you can pass them along, whatever. Uh, from my side, that's all. Wonderful. You can just send me whatever you want me to, uh, whatever you want me to have to have uh, to, to give to the uh, to the to the viewers. I would love to attach them to a pinned comment to the description. Um, well, I appreciate it very much. I think I think um, I would love to. I would have loved to get a uh, a background introduction uh, with you because I think. Uh, you have a very different background when it comes to experiencing Islam and leaving Islam because many ex-Muslims might just, uh, you know, might simply have, have basic experiences with Islam and then uh, and then leave Islam because uh, they can just not reconcile Islam's morality with their own morality or Islam's knowledge with their own knowledge. But I think... Um, I think you made a very intellectually important journey through Islam and out of Islam, which is why I would love to bring your perspective personally uh, to this channel again. So I would love to have you again here for just a, a completely personal talk just about you and about living Islam, about your experiences with it, your criticism of it. So uh, we all expect you here again. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I guess it's good, it's good night for me for today, and I'm looking forward to the next time. And we'll have uh, let's say we'll we'll pick a topic that is more uh, more controversial, uh -huh. and uh, you know, and we'll have a discussion on it and see where yeah. it goes. 
it will be but, about the yeah. mustache probably that's the most controversial thing yeah, <laughs> yeah. uh well wonderful thank you so much again Abdullah, for joining me uh thank you everybody for for joining thanks for viewing um I appreciate your uh, attendance, your uh, appreciation, your comments and everything that you have uh, left. Uh, I'll see you again. Have a fantastic day. And uh, as always, do you want to say a few things? Um, all I'm going to say is uh, science hafiz. Uh, good night. Good morning. Salaamu Alaikum. <laughs> uh, have a good day and uh, may uh, the good Lord be with you. Wow, that that's fantastic. I will I will just I will just say um stay away from Islam. Thank you. Uh, thanks everybody. <laughs>